my audible yeah yes ma'am good evening to all from ludhiana great to welcome you all to this monsoon quarterly meeting of society of fetal medicine of the ludhiana chapter today's topic topic pregnancy evaluation putting things in place ah as obstetricians if wishes were horses we all would like to put ectopics in, into the intrauterine place well jokes apart uh, nowadays in the past 3 decades there is an increasing incidence of ectopic because of increased stds increased promiscuity increasing infertility increased scarred uteri with the previous cesareans and in the increasing incidence of artificial reproductive technology so uh, any day is a good day to learn more and refresh our knowledge ectopic once a killer and with the only option as surgical treatment and that too with the radical treatment of self injectomy the treatment has evolved in decades and now we have a weapon of methotrexate with us so in this era of medical uh, management with such high resolution machines and with such advances in uh, early uh, it would be a part of fetal medicine only let's start this discussion on the diagnosis and management and we travel the whole array of conditions right from a frank ruptured pregnancy to a innocuous looking sac in a previous scar usage of medical methods and follow up on radiology along with the beta hcg everything we shall discuss today our august fit faculty both radiologists and obstetricians i welcome you and i hand over uh the mic to dr navin secretary of the fetal medicine foundation ludhiana chapter to carry on from here uh, dr navin you do not need any introduction he is the chief consultant radiology and fetal medicine at navya diagnostics a product of prismed ludhiana he is a certified and audited fmf operator and one of the first 50 in our country he is also an office bearer of the central society of fetal medicine and navin we have been hearing uh, with great pride since you are a localite your wonderful deliberations in national and international conferences thank you so let's thank begin you. yeah thank you so much kini thank you for those kind words and before wasting any time I, i'll just start with the first uh, form the first uh, thing that we're going to start doing is we're going to have a pre panel discussion quiz and uh, to basically assess a knowledge about ectopic pregnancies right so uh, in this what we are, what is going to happen is there is going to be a poll in which we have uh, five questions in those questions we will be given four answers option a b c and d and we have to choose one of them right and uh, so i think we could start it right away shubham can we have the first question please yeah so the first question is the crossover sign is used to a differentiate cervical ectopic from cesarean scar ectopic option b is predicts the surgical outcome of women presenting with abnormally invasive placenta in cesarean scar pregnancy option c is indicates pregnancy in the cornu and option d is diagnose interstitial pregnancy so i would request everyone to choose one option hello okay i'm sure then malli maata i'm waiting for everyone to vote sorry you have around around 50 or have voted till now we still have about 100 people to vote just 10 seconds more please 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 so uh, about 49% have chosen the first option and that is the option that's most popular and uh, right so i think we will go to the next uh, question please can we have the next question please
Shubham, can we have the next question, please? Yeah. The second question is, what are the pregnancies near uterotubal junction? Option A is eccentric pregnancies, pregnancies in the tube, and intramural ectopic pregnancy. Option B is cesarean scar pregnancy, cervical pregnancy, and intramural pregnancy. Option C is angular pregnancy, conval pregnancy, and interstitial pregnancy. Option D is none of the above. Yeah, about 10 seconds more. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right. Thank you so much. And uh, we could have uh, in this poll, we have seen that the option C is the most popular option with about 89%. Um, choosing that option. So we will know the answers at the very end, whether we are right. Okay. So can we have the next question, please? The third question. Yeah. The third question is, what are the classical common features of tubal ectopic? Option A is gestation sac, fetal node, yolk sac, cardiac activity, and collection in the Douglas pouch. Option B is empty uterus with collection in the Douglas pouch. Option C is bleb sign and bagel sign. Option D is empty uterus, cystic lesion in the adnexa, and ring on fire appearance on color Doppler. I'm seeing that the last option is pretty popular. Option D. So we'll find out at the very end whether we are right. So 10 seconds more. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. OK, thank you. Can yeah, we have the poll results? Can we have the poll results, please? Yeah. So this is the poll results. About 76% have opted for option D, which is the most popular option. Thank you. And can we have the next question, please? OK, the next question is, which of the coronal pregnancies are ectopic? Option A is ectopic in the interstitial portion of the tube, gestation sac in the communi communicating horn, or gestation sac in the non-communicating horn. Second option is gestation sac in one of the horn of a biconvate uterus. Option C is gestation sac in one half of the separate uterus. And option D is the sac eccentrically located in the uterine cavity. Okay. Yeah, the first option appears to be most popular. So I'll give about 10 seconds more. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thank you. So we have about 81% delegates who have opted for option A. Thank you so much. And let's go to the next question, please. The last question is, how to differentiate cervical pregnancy from abortion in progress? Option A is cervical pregnancy is pregnancy in the cervical canal, whereas option abortion in progress is pregnancy partly located in the uterine cavity Option B is cervical pregnancy is located beyond the internal loss and abortion in progress is located beyond the external loss. 
ऑप्शन सी इज स्लाइडिंग साइन पॉजिटिव इन सर्वाइकल प्रेगनेंसी एंड नेगेटिव इन अबॉशन इन प्रोग्रेस एंड ऑप्शन डी इज स्लाइडिंग साइन नेगेटिव इन सर्वाइकल प्रेगनेंसी एंड पॉजिटिव इन अबॉशन इन प्रोग्रेस so yeah looks like the last option is the most popular we'll give 10 seconds more to everyone 8 7 6 5 4 3 thank you so the last option is the most popular with about 63% of the delegates opting for that so it would be interesting to see after the panel discussion if many of us change our choices in the post panel quiz right thank you so much for participating in this quiz and we'll start the next section of the program right now which is the panel discussion and the presentation sir dr tilen you would like to say something sir you know please go ahead and let the presenters present the cases yeah so now we can start with the presentations uh, we will have we have three presentations on ectopic pregnancy the first presenter is dr jina dr jina bodole deka dr jina can you start sharing uh, start the process of sharing your screen meanwhile i'll just uh, say a few words about dr jina dr jina is a, a radiologist uh, with special interest in fetal medicine and musculoskeletal ultrasound and she's been a faculty at various conferences and prepared many paper uh, presented many sure. papers and uh, dr jina please am i visible and audible absolutely you are okay thank you yeah. thank you dr navin for those uh, kind words and uh, good evening everyone at the very outset i would like to thank the society of fetal medicine my teachers and the ludhiana chapter for giving me this opportunity and privilege of presenting two cases of ectopic in this very esteemed platform so the case one is a 32 years female who had a failed uh, early intrauterine pregnancy about a year ago at 7 weeks and her present clinical history was 8 weeks amenorrhea with a positive urine pregnancy test one week back and then she presented with spotting 3 days ago with my lower abdominal pain and a repeat urine pro, uh, pregnancy test uh, which was done a day before was faintly positive however she had no tachycardia and her bp was stable and her serum beta hcg was uh, 2150 mili international units per ml so she was referred for an ultrasound and on tvs study there was uh, no visible intrauterine a gestational sac or any evidence of intrauterine pregnancy and there were uh, two intramural uterine myomas and on evaluating the ovaries and the adnexa there was a cystic area in the right adnexa with a thick hyperechoic ring which was suggestive of the tubal ring sign and there was no embryo within it and this was highly uh, uh, predictive of an ectopic pregnancy and this tubal ring sign is also known resembling a, a donut or a bagel is also known as a bagel sign or the donut sign and this sign has almost a 95% positive predictive value in uh, ectopic pregnancy so it's very important to document the size of the mass and here in this case it was uh, 13 to 24 mm and the size of the sac was 16 into 8 mm and we also need to remember that this is not in the same patient that there is another sign called the blob sign where there is a hyperechoic uh, mass in the adnexa without any cystic area and this is also predictive of tubal pregnancy so we have two signs the bagel sign and the blob sign in a uh, ectopic tubal pregnancy so corresponding color doppler shows peripheral hypervascularity of the hyperechoic ring which is also known as the ring of fire sign but this is a uh, this uh, vascularity is not continuous but rather it is patchy and uh, segmental and this is a uh, quite different from a corpus luteum cyst where the va vascularity is more continuous 
So this adnexal mass with the tubal ring was seen to be separate from the right ovary with a good plane of cleavage. And the ovaries were normal. And there was no fluid in the pouch of Douglas and there was no hemoperitoneum present. So this was a diagnosis of an extra ovarian right adnexal mass with a tubal ring sign with no embryo, no hemoperitoneum and no intrauterine gestational sac. And in the background of a serum beta HCG of 2150, uh, which was uh, much above the discriminatory level. Uh, the features were suggestive of a probable right-sided ectopic unruptured tubal pregnancy. So her first line of management was a non-surgical treatment. And given that her sac size was less than 3.5 centimeters, there was no live pregnancy, no hemoperitoneum, and she was hemodynamically stable. So she was counseled regarding the expectant treatment, which was a wait and watch policy, but this is more effective at lower beta HCG levels of less than maybe 1,000 to 1,500 milli international units per ml. And medical treatment with uh, systemic methotrexate injection in single or multiple dose protocols is the second option. And this is quite safe and effective with minimal side effects. But she was also explained about the importance of close monitoring and patient compliance, along with serial evaluation of serum beta HCG. She opted for methotrexate injection and hence, uh, she was advised to do a baseline routine blood profile, renal function, and liver function test along with her serum beta HCG. So she was given a single dose of uh, systemic methotrexate injection IM, 50 mg, and uh, she was uh, advised not to take any folic acid supplements, alcohol, or no NSAIDs like ibuprofen. And she was advised a follow-up surveillance with uh, beta HCG levels on day four and uh, day seven, and then weekly for six weeks till her beta HCG comes to her non-pregnant state. But uh, she was also counseled that, you know, if her uh, beta HCG does not fall satisfactorily between four and uh, or between the fourth and the seventh day, that is more than 15%, then she might have to go for a second dose of methotrexate injection. And even if that fails, then she might have to opt for surgery. And also, she was asked to keep a close watch on her clinical uh, features like, you know, sudden onset, very uh, acute abdominal pain or, uh, you know, any hemodynamic instability. And uh, however, she was quite fortunate and she just complained of mild bleeding PV and mild colicky lower abdominal pain for a few hours on day three, which subsided. And her serum beta HCG levels also satisfactorily declined. And the last time uh, that I spoke to her, it was uh, 116 milli international units uh, per ml at four weeks. So this was a successful uh, medical management with methotrexate for an unruptured tubal pregnancy. The second case was a 34 years female uh, who does not have any history of STD or pelvic inflammatory disease, but she had a history of right-sided ruptured tubal ectopic gestation after natural conception two years ago, and self-injectomy was done then. Then she underwent her first cycle of IVF around six months ago, which failed. And then um, her second cycle of IVF was done uh, six weeks ago, and two frozen embryos were transferred four weeks, four days ago. So her serum beta HCG was positive on day 10 post-transfer and she was scheduled for her first routine ultrasound at seven weeks, that is five weeks after her embryo transfer. But before she could come for her routine scan around four days early, she presented with sudden onset severe abdominal pain, dizziness. Uh, however, there was no bleeding PV. And on examination, she had tachycardia and her BP had fallen to 100 by 60. And her serum beta HCG level was 1830 milli international units per ml. So she was sent for an ultrasound scan and on her TVS study, there was no intrauterine gestational sac or no embryo inside the uterine cavity, but there was an equate fluid collection in the uterine cavity, which was uh, suggestive of a pseudo gestational sac. And uh, there was also a heterogeneous mass in the posterior and the left lateral aspect of the uterus. And on taking a closer look at this, the left adnexal mass showed an intact gestational sac with a single live embryo and a yolk sac and a CRL corresponded to six weeks, one day. The left ovary was separate from it. Cardiac activity was present, suggesting a live embryo. And there was echogenic hemorrhagic fluid in the pelvic cavity all around and uh, the ovaries were normal. 
And on scanning the abdomen, there was free fluid in the peritoneal cavity suggestive of hemoperitoneum. So this was a diagnosis of a left-sided ruptured tubal ectopic gestation. There was an intact single gestational sac with a live embryo of six weeks plus, pseudogestational sac in the uterine cavity, and there was significant hemoperitoneum. So this was quite disappointing for the patient, and but she was counseled that uh, IVF is a well-known risk factor for ectopic pregnancy, and the risk increases with pre-existing tubal pathology and previous tubal surgery. And uh, the risk of recurrence also increases in the case of previous ectopic pregnancy, as was in her case. Surgical intervention was advised because medical treatment did not have any role here. And the main indications for surgery was a ruptured ectopic pregnancy and a hemodynamic instability and hemoperitoneum. So laparotomy with left-sided salpingectomy and peritoneal toileting under general anesthesia was done. And she was also advised post-op serial evaluation of beta HCG to rule out any uh, residual trophoblastic tissue after operation. So the take home message from my two cases are that the ultrasound along with serum beta HCG level monitoring plays a pivotal role in the early diagnosis and management of pubal ectopic center complications resulting in significant decrease in maternal morbidity and mortality. Management may be surgical or non-surgical depending on parameters like sac size, presence of rupture, live embryos, hemoperitoneum and hemodynamic stability and patient compliance. Serial serum beta HCG level monitoring are, is advised till the levels decrease to non-pregnant state. So thank you so much for your patient hearing and I want to thank all my teachers of SFM and the Scholar MD family for all their teaching, the guidance. Thank you so much. Stop Thank you, Dr. Gina, for that excellent and comprehensive analysis. And uh, I would like to congratulate on your excellent study that you have done. And uh, I think we can now go to the next presenter without wasting any more time. Uh, the next presenter is Dr. Kavita Agarwal. Uh, Dr. Kavita, could you start uh, uh, starting the process of screen sharing? Meanwhile, I'll say a few words about Dr. Kavita. Dr. Kavita is uh, a chief uh, consultant radiologist at the very popular Spectrum Scan and Research Center in Ludhiana. Uh, special interest in fetal medicine, gynecological imaging, and mammography. Uh, she is leading the Raksha Abhyan, which is a social in uh, initiative of IRA in, in the Ludhiana chapter. Welcome, Dr. Kavita. Over to you, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Naveen. And thank you, Dr. Gina, for wonderful cases. You have shown us cases of extra uterine ectopics, and I'm going to take up intra uterine ectopics. Am I audible clearly? Absolutely. Yeah. So I have two cases. I'll take up the first case. Our patient, a 29 year old female, second gravida, came for a routine early pregnancy scan. She has a past history of ectopic pregnancy. Her left salpingectomy has already been done. This, she had no history of pain abdomen, no spotting PV, and she's a very well-known case of endometriosis. Transabdominal and transvaginal scanning was done. Transabdominal scan revealed empty uterine, empty endometrial cavity, and there was a left adenexal chocolate cyst. On transvaginal scanning, we confirmed empty cavity. There was no intra, um, uh, there was no G-sac in the endometrial cavity, no pseudo-sac, no any other cystic area. And the uh, very typical chocolate cyst in her left head in excel region. And she, we found another finding. She had a small cystic area with a thick echogenic rim, and this was seen just abutting the uterine fundus. On magnified view, we, we could see a yolk sac within, so it confirmed that it to be a chorionic sac. And uh, since just recalling that the patient has already had her left self injectomy, we did 3D reconstructions for better localization of this lesion. On these 3D reconstruction images, we saw that the sac is seen to lie within the uterine myometrium with very thin layer of myometrium lateral to the sac. These are the tomographic images, which again reveal that there is a myometrial mantle all around the sac, but the myometrial mantle is very thin laterally. It was about 2 mm in thickness. On reviewing the grayscale images, we saw a thin echogenic line which joined this lesion to the endometrial cavity. This actually is the interstitial line. This represents the medialmost part of the fallopian tube. And this sign is referred to as interstitial line sign and is reported to have a very high sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of interstitial pregnancy. 
So uh, it was a case of interstitial pregnancy in this patient underwent leprotomy and convert resection was done. So this is a image which shows all the signs of interstitial pregnancy. We have an intra uterine sac lying within the myometrium, but outside the endometrial cavity. The sac is about 10 mm away from the endometrial cavity. And uh, there is very thin myometrial mantle. The dictum is that it should be less than 5 mm. And there was an interstitial sign which we saw on the grayscale image. So here, what is most important is that we need to differentiate it from angular pregnancy. Angular pregnancy is actually pregnancy within the endometrial cavity in the lateral angle. So the sac would be seen here. There would be thicker myometrium lateral to the sac. There'll be no bulge here. And an early detection of interstitial pregnancy is more so important because rupture is associated with very high maternal mortality rate because of its close association with the intramyometrial arcuate vasculature. So key features of this case were she was a known case of endometriosis, which is a very strong predisposing factor. She had a past history of ectopic for which left salpingectomy had already been done. She had a very uncommon site of ectopic, that is the interstitial part, on the same side where the where she's already got her left side tube removed. And she present, she showed the case showed all the typical diagnostic sonographic features of interstitial pregnancy. Moving on to the second case, she was a 34-year-old female, third gravida, conceived during lactational amenorrhea. There was history of previous two cesarean sections. UPT was positive two days prior to the scan, and there was no spotting PV. This was a transabdominal approach using a linear uh, probe. We can see the scar site, very nice dip at the level of the scar, thinned out myometrium, and a cystic area just at the level of the scar. This is again images which show very typical, very thin lower anterior myometrium. Increased vascularity in the lower anterior myometrium surrounding the cystic area. This is the transvaginal scanning which reveals can, uh, the sac implanted within the lower anterior myometrium. There was small yolk sac, there was a fetal pole and we could also see faint cardiac activity. So diagnosis of approximate five to six weeks pregnancy in lower uterine segment cesarean scar was given. Patient was operated with repair of the scar site. The differential in, in this case would be cervical pregnancy and abortion in progress. I think the main differentiating feature here should be the myometrial thickness. Thinned out myometrium, it is a scar pregnancy and cervical pregnancy would be lower down below the internal loss with normal myometrial thickness. Yes, another differential always remains abortion in progress, but if the sac is so low, low down in the cavity, the sac would usually be non-viable and without cardiac activity. And again, the myometrial thickness is going to be normal. This is a very beautiful image. I thought we'll just, I'll just share this with you. We've already seen interstitial pregnancy and Dr. Gina has very nicely covered both the ruptured and unruptured tubal ectopic. We have seen a scar pregnancy and Dr. Rajiv is here to complete our kitty to show us cervical pregnancy now. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kavita, for that uh, wonderful illustrative uh, presentation uh, showing two very rare sites of ectopic pregnancies, inter interstitial and uh, scar pregnancy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And can we have the next presenter, please, Dr. Rajiv Garg? Uh, Dr. Rajiv, could you start the process of sharing your screen, please. Meanwhile, Dr. Rajiv Garg is an eminent radiologist from Ludhiana, uh, senior consultant radiologist at uh, the popular Redneck Diagnostics. Area of special interest is fetal ultrasound, fetal eco, and 3D, 4D ultrasound. He's a regular speaker at various regional fora, and he is the central council member of IRIA. Welcome, Dr. Rajiv. Over to you, please. Thank you, Dr. Naveen. Rajiv, you need to share the screen. My slides are no open. Just a minute. Sir. Yeah, yeah. I think you have come out. So you need to join the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. You are hearing him. He's already in the meeting. You should not join it again. Don't join it again. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank SFM for giving this opportunity to present my case. So my case is on cervical ectopic pregnancy, which is one of the rare forms of the all the ectopic pregnancies. 
regarding brief case summary. Uh, she was a 28 year old primary presented with history of mild vaginal bleeding. Her UPT was positive and the previous two ultrasound examinations done at different clinics were negative for any evidence of intrauterine or extrauterine pregnancy. But her beta CG levels had risen from 500 international units to 1500 units within a span of one week. So the clinical diagnosis of pregnancy of unknown location was made and the repeat ultrasound examination was done at our clinic. We did both transabdominal and transvaginal ultrasound. Transabdominal ultrasound was done as there was suspicion of abdominal ectopic pregnancy was also. But luckily we could see a small gestational sac in the region of cervix beyond the internal loss and the upper uterine cavity was empty. No fetal pole was seen at this image and small uh, mild perisac vasculitis was also there. And transvaginal ultrasound was done. And transvaginal ultrasound shown a small well-defined gestational sac of five week gestation in the region of cervix below the level of internal loss and implanted in the endocervical canal and the wall of the cervix. Upper uterine cavity was empty and no fetal pole was visualized in the sac and ecogenic rim of good deciduous reaction was seen around the cell. I hope everyone is able to appreciate this ecogenic rim around well-defined small gestational sac, no fetal pole in the region of cervix uh, below the level of internal loss. Mild perisac vasculitis was also noted. Small amount of fluid was seen in the endocervical canal and there was absence of the sliding sign. So by putting pressure by vaginal probe, the sac was fixed, it was not moving, and it was fixed. So the diagnosis of the cervical ectopic pregnancy was made. The main differential is with the inevitable abortion. To clarify the things, I have, I'm showing you another case of inevitable abortion in which the sac will be present within the endocervical canal in the central part, not eccentrically located, but in the central part, and the sac margins will be irregular, while well, in the cervical ectopic, the sac margin will be regular. And most important thing is sliding sign. Side, sliding sign will be positive in the uh, uh, botting uh, uh, sac, for the botting sac. This is sliding sign, positive sliding sign. By putting pressure on the vaginal probe, the sac is moving within the cervical canal. So, Again, once again, I just repeat, by putting pressure, a botting sac will be moving up and down. In the so it is positive in the inevitable abortion. Cervical ectopic pregnancy is an uncommon form of the ectopic pregnancy in which there is direct implantation of the fertilized ovum into the wall of the cervix below the level of internal loss. Incidence is less than 1% of all the ectopic pregnancies. And the various risk factors are previous instrumentation, surgeries, washers, curators, IVF conceptions, IUCD placements, pelvic inflammatory disease, etc. The main complication is rupture and heavy bleeding, and bleeding is usually painless, as the cervix is mainly co composed of the fibrous connective tissue with only 15% smooth muscle. In the management of the cervical ectopic, DNC and surgical excision leads to profuse bleeding. The cervix fails to contract due to lack of smooth muscle. In our case, the diagnosis of the cervical ectopic was made very early in the first trimester, only small five-week gestational sac without any fetal pool. So the conservative management with the systemic method exit was done. The single dose of five, 50 milligram per meter square body surface area intramuscular method exit was given. And the follow-up was done with the beta CG levels on day one, four, and seven. Day one being the day of administering the methotrexate. And her beta CG levels had fallen by more than 15% by day seven. So there was no need of repeating the uh, second dose of methotrexate. If we can see the fetal pool, then we can do ultrasound under ultrasound guidance, direct injection of the embryo or sac with the potassium chloride or the methotrexate also before giving systemic methotrexate. If the diagnosis of cervical ectopic is made in the advanced gestation, then surgical debulking or the hysteroscopic section can be done, but massive bleeding is the main complication. So bleeding can be controlled by the tamponade with foliage catheter balloon inflated within the endocervical canal, or we can plan prior uterine artery embolization to reduce the risk of bleeding, or transvaginal ligation of the cervical punch of the uterine arteries can be done, 
multiple intracervical vasopressin injection can be given. With the advancement of the knowledge and the techniques, hysterectomy should be the last resort for the cervical ectopic pregnancy. It should be reserved for the patient who present with massive bleeding, which cannot be controlled by any other measures. That's all about cervical. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for that excellent, exhaustive review on a rare form of ectopic pregnancy, which is a cervical ectopic. And um, may I add that all our three presenters have, uh, I congratulate them. They have all been selected on, on the basis of a uh, competition that we had uh, that was judged by eminent judges. And um, these were the top three presentations. Thank you very much, Dr. Raji. And we can you, go to the next so yeah, part of our uh, program, which is the panel discussion with the, with the main chunk of our program. Uh, for that, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Tilian Praveen, sir, as a moderator on today's session. A topic pregnancy, putting things in place. He actually needs no introduction, but for those who are hearing for the first time, we know, all would know him as a great teacher and a passionate practitioner of fetal medicine for the last 30 years. He has won many awards and citations, published many papers, sitting president of the Society of Fetal Medicine as of now, the past president of IFMUMB, and the past vice president of IRIA. So Dr. Tilian, sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Um, before I start, I think I would like to congratulate you and your team, SFN Ludiana, for uh, putting up such a wonderful, wonderful show. And uh, I and then the way you have conducted the uh, quiz, it was amazing. And uh, I think the cases were very, very interesting and the options were very good. And I think it was a little tricky. And uh, I'm sure you are going to surprise us all with uh, the answers which you are going to give us. Thank now you, with that, thank you for your guidance, sir. Yeah. yeah. And then with that, I would like to congratulate all the three speakers, Gina, Kavita, as well as uh, Rajesh, because uh, all of them have uh, really presented wonderful cases. Uh, I mean, like uh, the common ectopic pregnancy, that is the tubal, then the rare forms of the ectopic pregnancies, such as the cesarean scar, as well as the interstitial, and then the, the uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the cervical scar, uh, cervical pregnancy. So with this, uh, let us, uh, I think uh, we, we really have, I mean, the speakers have really covered the whole of it, but still I we would like to take you through uh, the panel because uh, I would have, I have a wonderful panel with me. I'm sure they are going to help us uh, sort out a lot of things and put things into place. One second, I'm just uh, getting there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So with this, um, as you all know, ectopic pregnancy is uh, one of the nightmares that we all face, both as an imageologist and as well as clinical practicing uh, a gynecologist or the obstetrician who is going to get into this sort of an emergency situation where it is quite tricky clinically, biochemically, as well as uh, ultrasound wise. Uh, there are certain um, uh, things that have to be sorted out. And I think uh, this particular panel is going to enlighten us uh, regarding the various aspects of uh, ectopic pregnancies and uh, take us through giving us solutions and uh, helping us to find some clues in order to uh, uh, diagnose these ectopics as well as manage these ectopics. Uh, basically, either uh, as, a, as an expectant or a conservative management or a surgical approach. Uh, so this is what we are going to do. Basically, when we all know that the ectopic pregnancies uh, can be classified in various ways, like usual and unusual, intrauterine, I mean, uterine and extrauterine uh, uh, ectopics. And uh, most important thing is whenever we have an ectopic pregnancy, remember, it's, we need a holistic approach. Holistic approach in the form of uh, the clinical presentation, biochemical parameters, as well as the ultrasound. Now, let us uh, uh, take the help of our panelists. We have wonderful panelists like Dr. Chinmay Ratha, who is my colleague at Hyderabad, and uh, she's wonderful and one of the best speakers I've ever heard. And she's going to enlighten us about various aspects of ectopic pregnancy. She, is a, uh, she regularly practices uh, on fetal medicine as well as uh, uh, gynecology some. And uh, Dr. Lardman's call. She is a name to reckon with uh, as far as the Ludhiana and uh, Punjab is concerned. 
She's a radiologist and uh, she has been practicing for the past almost 25 to 30 years and an absolutely amazing speaker. Deepak Bansal, I think you don't need to introduce Deepak at all. He's very uh, he's as efficient and absolutely uh, to the point and a great orator and very has very, very clear concepts. And then we I have uh, Manit Kaur, who is a radiologist, uh, who is a gold medalist in uh, the entrance for uh, post-graduation. And uh, I think she had developed passion towards uh, ultrasound, uh, fetal ultrasound, and then she got trained under Dr. Suresh at uh, MediScan. Then we have Gitanjali Kaur, gynecologist. She has been, she is the vice president of uh, uh, Ludhiana Obstetrics and Gynecological Society. And uh, she's an eminent speaker. She has been working in, in various aspects of gynecology um, for the past more than 10, 20 years. Then we have Dr. Thapar. Thapar, she is a specialist in reproductive medicine. And uh, she has been practicing uh, in, uh, in reproductive medicine for the past 12 years. And uh, we have Kavita Bhatti, who is the professor head of the department of Ludhiana CMC. You have a huge panel. And then I'm sure we are going to take a full, make full use of this panel to enlighten us and clear our doubts. Uh, welcome you all. Uh, and I, I'm sure you are going to help us in sorting out various problems. Now, can I ask Manit Kaur, how do you define ectopic pregnancy? Let us start off from the basics. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, we can define an ectopic pregnancy as implantation of an embryo at a site other than the endometrium. The key word here being the endometrium. So uh, the extra uterine pregnancies are clearly ectopic, like in the tube or in the ovary or in the abdomen. But how do we define intrauterine ectopics? The main thing is that there has to be a breach of the endometrial junction. So the uh, uh, then ectopics, the intrauterine ectopics can be like cervical ectopic, the cesarean scar ectopic, or the intramural ectopics. Or interstitial. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mani. It was wonderful that uh, you have given us a very clear concept. One is that there should be a breach in the endometrium. Two is most of the uterine ectopic pregnancies are the ones which are which require to breach the endometrium before we label them as a ectopic pre pregnancy. And of course, the extra uterine uh, are all obviously outside the uterus. Now, then we have uh, Kavita Bhati. How early can we detect uh, HCG in the urine pregnancy test? Because, you know, uh, the present day scenario is that any lady missing her uh, period, first thing she does is to get a urine test done. Uh, and then can a negative urine test rule out ectopic pregnancy? Dr. Kavita, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Dr. Kalita. Thank you, sir, for the question. And uh, going on to the first question, how early can we detect SG in the urine pregnancy test? It has been reported to be detected as early as the first expected uh, period date. So if even if she's not missed the period on the first day of her expected period date, and the SCG level can be detected much earlier in the serum. So that is approximately, let's say, six to eight days after the LH surge or 21 to 22nd day of a regular 28-day cycle length. And of course, a negative urine test uh, does not rule out ectopic pregnancy. They have reported there are many published cases which say that uh, in spite of a negative urine test, it can be an ectopic pregnancy. Approximately 1% uh, patients do have a negative urine test. And there are many reasons for this, actually. The beta SCG, because the chorionic villa is less in amount, therefore the beta SCG may be very less uh, in the urine or in the serum. And hence, it may be taken as a negative urine test. Okay. One Thank should you. have in mind that uh, an ectopic pregnancy cannot be ruled out there's always a 1% chance of having an ectopic in spite of a negative unit test. Wonderful, Dr. Kavita. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer so that it clear, clears our doubts regarding the, uh, the time when we expect the urine pregnancy test to be positive. And if it is negative, do we give any importance as far as ruling out an ectopic pregnancy? Now I have Dr. Chinmay Ratha. Chinmay Ratha, can you just tell us what is the serum beta HCG? Uh, when is pregnancy confirmed? Can it determine the location and viability of the pregnancy? 
sir. Uh, thank you so much for putting me on this panel. And uh, serum beta HCG is actually uh, it's a chemical. It's a glycoprotein called human chorionic gonadotrophin, which is produced initially by the uh, syncytiotrophoblastic mm -hmm. tissue, and that later on goes on to become the placenta. So that is the main origin of this uh, beta human chorionic gonadotrophin, and this in a way indicates the presence of a pregnancy related material in the body because we assume that it is being produced by the or, uh, tissues that are original producers of this chemical. So when we detect this uh, chemical in the urine, some part of it gets metabolized in the kidney and gets excreted in the urine. About 20% of it is excreted in the urine. So if that is detected in the urine, we assume that there is a pregnancy going on inside. So like you said, when a woman misses her period, she goes on and does a pregnancy test. And in that, if the beta subunit is seen in the uh, urine and the pregnancy test com comes positive, we assume there is a pregnancy inside, but there are many other sources of HCG and uh, they can be produced by non-pregnant uh, tissues like the ovary sometimes and sometimes the colon, sometimes some other uh, HCG secreting tumor in the body. Therefore, the presence of HCG in the urine is not confirmatory of pregnancy. And hence, just because the urine pregnancy test is positive, we cannot say that there is definitely a pregnancy. We cannot comment on the viability. We can never comment on the location. So beyond that, the workup requires ultrasound. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what is this discriminatory zone? We have been using this terminology left, right, and center. And what is its clinical relevance? Like we just discussed, there are many uh, reasons for which HCG can be produced in the body. So over the years, when the uh, beta HCG started being correlated with the presence of pregnancy, it was assumed that after a certain level of beta HCG in the serum, we should be able to see a pregnancy sac in the uterus for us to define that this is related to a normally growing pregnancy. So a discriminatory zone would be that level of beta HCG beyond which we should be able to see a pregnancy sac in the uterus and confirm the presence of a normally growing intrauterine pregnancy. Now, this zone has been different through literature, uh, through years. If we see the literature, initially the values were uh, different, then the values were different. I think as the ultrasound resolution is increasing and we are being able to detect more and more of uh, sacs in utero better, the discriminatory zone is now somewhere between 1,000, 1,500 to 2,000, 2,500. You've given an upper limit of 3,500, which is also, I mean, uh, data is uh, kind of scattered on in this area. But beyond that level of serum beta, HCG, if we do not see a gestational sac in the uterus, we should start worrying about what we have just discussed as the pregnancy not being in the uterus an ectopic pregnancy or some other source of the beta HCG. Wonderful. Thank you. So actually, so it obviously means that um, just because the gestational sac is not seen in the uterine cavity by a transvaginal examination uh, beyond a, a, a discriminatory zone, because it's a wide zone, and there are a lot of papers which have been published that even when the beta HCG titers were 800 international units, you do find sometimes the gestational sac in the uterine cavity or an ectopic pregnancy. So that is the reason why this, this particular discriminatory zone became a little dicey. Now, with this as a scenario, uh, what is the serial, serial serum human gonadotrophins and its uh, clinical applications, and how does serum progesterone help us? Right, sir. So, like I said, that uh, there could be many sources of production of that beta HCG. So, with regard to the diagnosis of pregnancy, we can get confused when we see a beta HCG present there. But suppose we see a doubling. Now, pregnancy is a process which is a time-bound process and the uh, trophoblastic tissue is working on a given timeline. And in a normal pregnancy timeline, there is a, a rate at which the hormones double. So particularly for beta HCG, in about 48 hours, a 66% rise, like you've written, is something which is expected in a normal growing pregnancy unit. So if we have measured a beta HCG today and we are not sure whether this pregnancy is intrauterine, viable, non-viable, and I said just with one value, we cannot comment on it, then we can just measure the same beta HCG in the same woman after 48 hours and look at the trend. So if the trend is that there is an increase of at least 66% in that 48 hours, that is a very reassuring feature when we are looking for a uh, hopeful for an intrauterine viable pregnancy. And that indicates that probably this pregnancy unit is growing successfully. 
if that there is a rise but it is not to that extent that becomes worrisome for us because it means there is trophoblastic tissue now mind you trophoblastic tissue has the power to eat into other tissues so it's an invasive tissue there is invasive tissue it's not indicative of a normally growing uh, in utero normally placed pregnancy then it could be ectopic so that is where we start worrying if the values are falling down that is probably a sign of a failing pregnancy it that's not good either so we have we can make use of this particular uh, serial uh, serum human chorionic gonadotropins to confirm or to identify a failing pregnancy uh, now what about the progesterone sir a progesterone um, theoretically is a very good hormone because the name is progesterone it is the hormone which supports pregnancy mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, beta hcg it's the human chorionic gonadotropin itself stimulates the corpus luteum to pro, uh, produce more progesterone and keep the pregnancy unit intact but honestly sir we really do not use serum progesterone levels in clinical practice anymore to discriminate between these uh, conditions of ectopic or non viable pregnancy because we have better methods now we have a good correlation we have quick methods to do beta hcg as well as go quick ultrasound and uh, other correlations so um, i don't think we clinically use it the theoretical use is the serum progesterone level should be higher than 20 for us to the say that things are going yeah. fine yeah yeah now but then then what about this m6 mathematical model particularly when you are dealing with a pregnancy of unknown location true sir i mean sometimes we we do use it to correlate that you know there should be a because if you have a, a non uh, pregnant relation pregnancy related beta hcg production it will not correlate with your pro, uh, progesterone production so if you have progesterone as well as beta hcg and that is growing maybe there is pregnancy and if it is growing in a uterine location everything should grow in a in a systematic manner and in an expected manner if you don't have that growth uh, as it should be then it's probably not a pregnancy related uh, or a healthy pregnancy related uh, biochemical yeah. milieu yeah. yeah thank you thank you very much yeah. actually this m6 model is one of the things which is ex extremely used particularly for uh, identifying the pregnancy of unknown location the first step is to do the progesterone to assess the viability if it is a non viable they are not bothered they will ask the patient to come back after one week to get a urine test done if the urine test is negative they ask them to go back i mean there is no follow up if the urine test is positive then they would like to do the beta hcg if the progesterone levels are uh, higher then definitely they would think in terms of a viable pregnancy once they think that it is a viable pregnancy that is what the m6 model says if the viability then you need to identify whether it's a failing i mean which is a, a viable intrauterine train viable ectopic train or persistent pul so this is how they make use of this progesterone as well as the hcg levels now moving on to the other thing alarmant score could you please uh, explain us the ultrasound features of tubal ectopic pregnancy which gina has done but uh, with your experience i think we would be much more enlightened by going through this uh, particular ultrasound features because this is one of the commonest ones and uh, i want you to be very very clear so that the uh, audience and the delegates are going to be benefited by uh, getting a summarized uh, uh, ultrasound features as far as the tubal ectopic pregnancy is concerned thank you sir thank you for having me over the panel today and thank you sir and, and dr nivi so the first thing whenever we find a tubal ectopic pregnancy we need to largemans can you just come closer yeah. to the so that we are you are not yeah. very yeah. clearly audible yeah am i audible right sir yes very nice fine fine so uh, whenever we uh, go ahead and see a ectopic pregnancy we need to see two things and one is the uterus and then we have the adnexal findings so in the first in the uterine uh, in the uterine findings the uterus is enlarged it is juicy like you have more vascularity in the uterus you will find more vessels that means that there is pregnancy somewhere so you may have a thickened uh, endo uh, endometrium or maybe if the patient is bleeding you may not have a thickened endometrium so not necessary so you may have if you have a thickened endometrium you may have a decidualized endometrium for for decidualization it means that you have tiny anechoic areas which are seen in the periphery of the thickened endometrium which are not showing any ecogenic rim so that is how you differentiate from an intrauterine pregnancy so 
that is a decentralized endometrium. Or you may have a small fluid collection cent is seen in the central, uh, cent uh, central uh, it's seen within the center of the endometrial cavity. It is central, it is, uh, will not show any vascularity, and it is uh, changes when you change from longitudinal to transverse, or maybe also change in shape due to peristalsis. So this is how you differentiate a pseudo gestational sac, which is seen with ectopic pregnancy, vis-a-vis -vis an intrauterine pregnancy, which shows an eccentric subendometrial lucration and shows an echogenic rim of chorionic tissue and also shows vascularity and does not show a changing appearance. So this is how you differentiate a pseudo gestational sac from a true intrauterine gestational sac. Then we have the adenexal findings. In the adenexal findings, the most common presentation of a tubal ectopic is a mass, is a bleb sign or a blob sign or an inhomogeneous mass predominantly showing a hyperechoic aquatexture. The reason behind the hyperechoic genicity is that it is a chorionic tissue. So it is seen within the tube, maybe seen, you may have hematosalpings associated with it. You may have fluid in the adenexa. Then that's the common presentation. Then you may have the presentation of an echogenic tubal ring. This is predominantly an extra uterine gestational sac. It could be seen with a yolk sac or without a yolk sac. You may have a fetal node, which may show viability as seen in this particular slide, which shows us that there is a viable extra uterine gestational sac seen in the adenexa. And on color Doppler, you not only see vascularity in the around the gestational sac representing the trophoblastic tissue, or you also see the viable embryo seen within the gestational sac. So this is called as a definitive sign. Once you have a topic, you have an ecogenic tubal ring, you have a yolk sac, that's a definitive sign, what is called bagel sign or donut sign seen in about 20, 16 to 20% of patients. And that's the second picture which I'm trying to show is the middle one is the one which you see a blob sign. It's an inhomogeneous, heterogeneous mass, which is seen in the extra, it's seen extra ovarian in location. So I would like to highlight how do we actually see the extra ovarian nature of a mass. One is you can do a sliding sign. But remember, when you do a sliding sign in a patient who's having already having a lot of pain, it is difficult to elicit this sliding sign. So what you have to do is you have to see the margin of the ovary, which is lying adjacent to this mass. And in the ovary, you have antral follicles. So the antral follicles will face towards this mass. That means this particular mass is extra ovarian in location. Secondly, you can also use color Doppler. Remember, the ovary and the adjacent mass will do not will not share the same supply. Will have different supplies. So that's how you differentiate an extra ovarian extra ovarian masses. Then yeah. you do have a bagel sign in the last, as shown by Dr. T. L. N. Yeah. So and of course you have hemoperitoneum, which may be mild, moderate to severe, along with presence of hemorrhagic uh, exudates in the POD. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ladmas. And uh, this is just a 3D rendering where you can see the tube, and at the at the fimbrial end, you can find this sort of a gestational sac, uh, which is uh, clearly demonstrated. Now, uh, um, Deepak, um, good evening. And then, uh, would you like to please uh, enumerate uh, the uh, ultrasound features of an ovarian ectopic and its differential diagnosis from carpus luteum? Deepak. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, I Hello. unmuted myself. Uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, this question, uh, Dr. Praveen. Um, uh, ovarian ectopic uh, in my last uh, 20 years of practice, I have never been able to confirm for sure that the diagnosis of uh, an ectopic I have made is an ovarian ectopic. So it is a very tough diagnosis to make. It is not that rare. 2 to 3% of all ectopic pregnancies would be ovarian ectopic pregnancies. So it becomes very tough because um, if it is intact, hemoperitoneum has not happened, then this is implanted over the surface of the ovary. It would 
look like as any uh, cyst would be present that would be present in the ovary. The only difference can be then that it would show us a ecogenic rim, but that uh, showing of an ecogenic rim, which has been described as uh, basal sign and beautifully shown by Dr. Gina and uh, in the previous uh, this thing also, it is also uh, if somebody doesn't understand, it's like a donut sign. There is a very thick ecogenic wall and the central anechoic area. Now that is also very tough because we know that uh, even uh, corpus hemorrhagicums, corpus luteums, they can also have a blood within them, which can be ecogenic and can be around the wall, can be present. So it is a very tough situation when it is intact to be able to say that this is uh, ovarian atopic. And as we all know that uh, use of color Doppler is almost useless in this situation because ring of fire can be seen in the corpus luteum and uh, also can be seen uh, across, around the sac also. So that is very tough. Uh, uh, secondly, that uh, in many cases, when there is hemoperitoneum, uh, uh, we can very easily diagnose uh, an ectopic pregnancy uh, because there is a, a uterine cavity is uh, empty, beta SCG is uh, more than discriminatory zone or UPT is positive. And when we are looking at, we are getting a typical picture of a complex mass in the adnexa, uh, which is predominantly solid looking, small anechoic areas. There is a particular trait. So we know this is hemoperitoneum where it becomes so difficult sometimes to even identify ovary, that this is exactly the ovary. Then when to say whether this is a, a sac is at the fimbria or at the ovarian surface, it is very, very tough. So. Uh, but if we have diagnosed that this is an ectopic pregnancy, whether it is on tubal or ovarian, so certainly we could put the laparoscope or do the surgery and we can uh, very easily find out that uh, what it is looking like, whether it is tubal, fimbrial, or it is ovarian. But having said that, the final diagnosis has to be on histopathology. Two things need to be seen that uh, you need to demonstrate that fallopian tube is... Uh, intact in uh, entire course. And the second thing is uh, we need to demonstrate on histopathology some sort of ovarian tissue in the sac wall. So as far as uh, differential diagnosis is concerned, uh, uh, now uh, hemoperitoneum can also happen, we all know, because of uh, uh, ruptured uh, corpus luteum or corpus hemorrhagicum, <clears throat> and that will have almost uh, indistinguishable uh, uh, features. The only thing possible is that uh, which uh, Dr. Simon Marr once explained, and I use it in my practice, and it is uh, uh, I find it quite uh, useful. Is that presence of typical ecogenic tissue, which we can suspect that it is a chorionic tissue, and if uh, that is there, so then we can suspect that uh, old thing is probably because of ectopic, and also clinical data is also very, very relevant if UPT is positive and beta CG is high. So the other rare possibility can be a bleeding ovarian tumor, which can also cause hemoperitoneum and can be a differential diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, it was nice that you made it very clear that uh, the ovarian uh, ectopic pregnancy diagnosis is not that easy. There are various things that you need to depend upon. And uh, probably even biochemistry to some extent can help us in differentiating between the ovarian ectopic as well as the carpus luteum. And uh, as you said, uh, the hemoperitoneum can be seen in both of them when there is a rupture of the ectopic or when there is a rupture of a carpus luteum uh, hemorrhage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Geeta Anjali, uh, can you please explain us the ultrasound features of abdominal pregnancy? Good evening uh, and thank you for the question, sir. Uh, abdominal pregnancy is very, very rare. And uh, in very early pregnancy, the gestational sac will be seen outside of the uterus. You will see a mass like a uterus, uh, abdominal or a pelvic mass, which resembles a uterus and it will be empty. And the sac will be seen outside. Yes, it can, in very early cases, it can mimic a tubal pregnancy. Uh, later on, the fetus usually can be seen in either of the pouches that is the most common place. So uh, the fetus will be very near to the abdominal wall and there will be no uterine wall seen. Especially if the fetal part is, will be seen right next to the bladder with no uterine, intervening uterine wall in between the, in between the them. And many a times in uh, places where early ultrasounds are done, yes, it gets picked up usually very early. 
but if it is picked up late then uh, placenta also will be seen in a very abnormal location out of the uterus there will be lot, uh, very less fluid oligohydramnos is another thing that helps us in uh, diagnosing it and uh, uh, the basic thing is that you see a mass which looks like uterus and which is uh, away from the fetus the fetus is sep seen separately and the uterus mass is seen separately so that is how it helps us to diagnose the condition thank you thank you very much geetanj i mean it was very good. okay how, how, how do you differentiate it from the carnival pregnancy so uh, the abnormal pregnancy usually the fetal lie is very fixed in that it it doesn't move while in the carnival pregnancy you if you see it can be seen to move the lie is very fixed in uh, abdom abdominal pregnancy yeah thank you thank you very much now uh, dr thapar uh as you are uh, you are an infertility specialist and a reproductive medicine specialist then i i i'm sure you will be getting across, coming across this sort of heterotopic pregnancy quite often in your practice what is the incidence and uh, how do you correlate them so thank you for the question sir and good evening everyone so heterotopic pregnancy is basically a multiple gestation in which one pregnancy is in the uterus and one is extra uterine and mostly in the tube and very rarely like deepak has said in the ovary or cervix and of course uh, interstitial pregnancy is possible uh, in it's not a common presentation and most of the literature is only quoting case reports in my practice in the last uh, 20 years of doing ivf i have only seen one case of heterotopic pregnancy in which uh, the sac one one was an intrauterine sac and one was in the tube in which a laparoscopy done removed the uh, extra uterine pregnancy and the intra uterine pregnancy actually progressed to term and as you know it is rightly said that with the art uh, procedures uh, gaining popularity and need uh, we are seeing more and more ectopic pregnancies and of course chances of seeing heterotopic pregnancy are also rising uh, the incidence which was quoted as 1 in 30000 Uh, is now quoted as one in hundred in ART pregnancies, especially if the patient has had history of IVF or IUI, or even uh, just simple ovarian uh, stimulation. So uh, when I was looking at the case reports, interestingly, I found a lot of reports where uh, they were natural conceptions, and some of them were diagnosed as late as twenty six weeks, which is uh, which is really you know uh, remarkable. that uh, a pregnancy presenting a heterotopic pre pregnancy presenting in the 6th month as acute abdomen and uh, hemoperitoneum so that was quite surprising so anything is possible so what comes to my mind is that you know when as a infertility specialist if i am um, doing ivf or an any art procedure for a patient the first thing is to suspect so every time we are diagnosing a pregnancy after an ivf it is it should be mandatory to look at the adenexa yes. even if we see a sac in utero i think uh, our mind should be always looking for another pregnancy elsewhere that is how we there are less chances of uh, missing it yeah that's a wonderful message uh, dr thapa because um, as students we were told that uh, once you demonstrate a gestation sac in the uterine cavity you can as well forget about the ectopic but then that's not true anymore we do find a lot of ectopics and heterotopic ectopic pregnancies occurring now so it is mandatory for anyone whoever is practicing the ultrasound in early pregnancies not only to identify the gestation sac within the uterine cavity but also do a search in the adnexal region in order to identify an heterotopic pregnancy that's a wonderful message thank you very much and it's an important one now how do you manage these heterotopic pregnancies now see the whole idea is to let the intrauterine pregnancy grow and reach term especially if it is an art procedure you know that that patient is uh, emotionally already and financially spent and the idea is to remove the extra uterine pregnancy now if we diagnose it early and the patient presents uh, with either a spotting or a pain and a routine ultrasound done the first ultrasound that is at 5 to 6 weeks diagnoses a uh, another extra uterine sac then two options are available it can be a conservative approach or it can be a surgical approach if the patient is hemodynamically stable we can see an extra uterine pregnancy 
uh, with a good interventional radiologist, I think um, instilling uh, KCL into the extrauterine pregnancy is a possibility with the intrauterine pregnancy continuing to term. And uh, the data does suggest that 60 to 65% of these pregnancies can continue to term and deliver, but 30% will still miscarry, right? But uh, the problem arises if the heterotropic pregnancy is interstitial, because that is a very, very tacky situation because uh, A, diagnosing it, B, uh, now this pregnancy can rupture. And if it is diagnosed late, which is a case in majority of the patients with the interstitial heterotropic, they might present with rupture or hemoperitoneum, then excising that pregnancy and repairing the uterus uh, there is a little risk of it rupturing later in the gestation as the intrauterine pregnancy grows. So that is the only uh, dilemma which a lot of uh, uh, you know gynecologists will face, and these patients will have to be monitored very very closely. That is how I look at yeah, it. Yeah, well, well. Now I think yes, it's a good uh, pertinent point regarding the interstitial pregnancy. Uh, we do agree that uh, whenever it is peripherally situated, closer to the tube, there is always a possibility of the, the, uh, the distal end of the interstitial tube getting distended and rupturing. But suppose it is more medially placed uh, in the interstitial tube. Would you like to have us uh, interfere and then put in uh, methotrexate or uh, potassium chloride? Uh, we are actually using KCL for reducing triplets or quadruplets in I the know. past. We have used yes. it. Yes, so yes. I think using KCL would be a safe bet in good hands. Of course, I, I don't do it. I always yeah. refer it yeah. to Deepak. He's yeah. right here. Yeah. So. But, then, but then if you suppose you think that the KCL, but the KCL only produces uh, asystole. The aim of uh, ablation is to ablate the trophoblastic tissue. Yes. Uh, but then in that situation, we need to use an anti-metabolite, particularly in the form of a methotrexate. Initially, we were very skeptical about using a systemic methotrexate or even intrasac methotrexate, um, fearing that it, there can be a systemic effect. But then the recent literature says that intrasac methotrexate can be instituted as it will not have systemic absorption and is devoid of uh, methotrexate cytotoxicity. What do you say about it? What is your call on it? I think if I'm faced with a pregnancy, heterotropic pregnancy diagnosed late stage, supposing yeah. it's a big fetus, uh, I could consider intrasac methotrexate. But if we diagnose it fairly early, uh, probably KCL would uh, just... Yeah, aspirate and put the KCL. Yes, yes. that yes. is what yes. I would... Uh, very good. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for the inputs. Now, uh, Deepak, uh, um, what are the pregnancies which are known as the, uh, the uterotubal junction, which are occurring at the uterotubal junction? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Praveen, this is a very, uh, actually very important topic to discuss uh, because it's a, a big problem, uh, the classifying our types of a topic, because if we... Uh, uh, assign a wrong name to an ectopic pregnancy or a pregnancy. So uh, the management is entirely different and the outcomes are entirely different. So in that context, uh, there are pregnancies uh, near uterotubal junction. That means a junction uh, that is internal tubal ostium, fallopian tube, where it is connected to the uterine cavity. The pregnancies which are implanted around that uh, ostium, internal tubal ostium, these are pregnancies near uterotubal junction. And uh, generally, um, do you draw uh, any line for the uterotubal junction, or uh, how do you, I mean, go approximation, or uh, is there any way that you can uh, say that this is medial and that is lateral? Yeah, so uh, no, so that is possible uh, with the help of round ligament uh, distortion, but of course that is uh, 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 operative uh, uh, finding. It, it is very tough to say uh, on ultrasound. Now, uh, I, I would try to uh, diagnostically differentiate between these three and probably by that way, uh, it would be better understanding. So we include uh, what people called as angular pregnancies, cornual pregnancies and interstitial pregnancies here. So interstitial pregnancy is an ectopic pregnancy. Cornual pregnancy and angular pregnancies are eccentric pregnancies. So it is better never to call a 
interstitial tubal pregnancy or coronal pregnancy. This is very, very important. And yeah. please uh, go through the literature very carefully because the, the literature of even the recent past has been uh, interchangeably using this and uh, confusing all of us that what kind of pregnancy is what. And that gives us a false impression uh, that coronal pregnancy also may have poor outcome. However, angular and coronal pregnancies will have better outcomes and we need to uh, go uh, conservative management on these pregnancies and interstitial pregnancies uh, are ectopic pregnancies and where uh, uh, conservative management uh, is uh, strictly no no and uh, because there is almost no chance of having a viable fetus out of these interstitial pregnancies and risks are very very high and can be fatal for the mother if uh, bleeding happens so, uh, so how to distinguish between uh, these is uh, interstitial pregnancy is within the fallopian tube by definition by Dr. Timotrish is one centimeter from the uh, lateral end of the uterine cavity. So this is outside the uterine cavity. Dr. Muneeth explained the definition. Uh, intrauterine pregnancy does not mean pregnancy within the uterine corpus. It means within the uterine cavity that is endometrial cavity. So this is outside the endometrial cavity. This is with, within the part of the fallopian tube which traverses through the myometrium that is called as interstitial part. There it is there. So uh, how to distinguishing, distinguish uh, radiologically, sonologically between interstitial pregnancies and other pregnancies. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it has already been uh, shown beautifully by Dr. Kavita that uh, uh, there are multiple signs, but what I would suggest is now many people would agree there are enough literature and people who are experienced, they know that less than 5 mm of myometrial mantle does not work well. Uh, so that sign does not help us. What helps us maximum is interstitial line sign. So we must try to concentrate transabdominally, transvaginally, 3D, 2D, whatever, that we can, uh, uh, we can uh, 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 clearly um, uh, find out that that sac is away from the uterine cavity and there is the interstitial line sign. But there is one another sign which I particularly use, which has not been described in the literature, but I am very confident using uh, uh, that sign is uh, that if it is intrauterine, say for example, angular pregnancy, then it is it distends the uterine cavity. So if we follow uterine cavity margins on 2D or 3D, we see that it is intrinsic sac which is distending the uterine cavity and they are going separate at the angle of the uterine cavity. However, if it is outside the uterine cavity in the interstitium, then it pushes on the cavity and it behaves as if it is an extrinsic lesion from the uterine cavity. And that gives me a very good confidence in distinguishing between, the two, uh, between these pregnancies. As far as angular and coronal pregnancies are concerned, definition of coronal pregnancy is, it is a pregnancy which is present in a uterus with Mullerian abnormality. So whether it's a biconvate uterus, uniconvate uterus or a septate uterus, then we call it coronal pregnancies. But now we realize that distinguishing between Mullerian anomalous uterus or normal uterus, it does not make any difference. So let us call angular pregnancies or coronal pregnancies, all of them as eccentric pregnancies. So yeah. this is yeah. eccentric intrauterine pregnancies and then is interstitial pregnancies. Yeah, that is wonderful that uh, you have shared your experience regarding the distension of the uterine uterus. Uh, do you think that uh, the breach in the endomyometrial tension will help us in uh, differentiating an ectopic from an intrauterine, whether it is coronal or whether it is a uh, angular. Yeah, so uh, as far as, uh, I mean, as far as intramural ectopic, I've never been able to diagnose one. So uh, I cannot share any no, no, I'm not talking that about intramural, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. but uh, however, in this context, I think my, it is very tough sometimes. It is such a dicey situation there. It is becomes very tough to look, to be able to locate a typical findings, but over the period of um, uh, last few years, till the time I am following that interstitial line sign and this, whether it is an uh, intrinsic uh, sac or it is an extrinsic uterine cavity sac compressing on that, these work well for me. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure. I've never concentrated on this uh, endometrial breach there. Okay. Very nice. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, these are the uh, formal pregnancies. Uh, Dr. Uh, Deepak, would you, uh, would you see that these are the five possibilities that you can see whenever there is a pregnancy implanted in the communicating or non-communicating? So these first three are the ectopics. That is the A, B, C. This is the interstitial. And yeah. that is the communicating horn with the gestation sac. It's a non-communicating horn with the gestation sac. Whereas it is, this is a, a coordinate uterus, bicoordinate or bicolic uterus, uh, bicorporeal uterus, where you can see one of the gestation sac in one of the corporeal. And here there is a separate uterus in one of the half of the uh, septum I mean, uh, uterus, there is a gestation sac. And here we have a eccentrically located normal and trained gestation sac. So these are the various presentations that you have to keep in mind. Now, uh, Kavita, Dr. Kavita Bharti, uh, can you please uh, enumerate us regarding? Regarding cervical ectopic pregnancy, please. Hello, Dr. Kavita, are you there? Uh, Dr. Kavita, please unmute your mic. Uh. He is not here. Sir, you can I'm carry on, here, please, sir. sir. Dr. Praveen, you can please carry on. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, whenever we have this uh, cervical ectopic pregnancy, the most important thing that we need to understand is that quite often it is iatrogenic. And uh, you normally see the gestational sac uh, below the internal loss. That is one of the most important factor which we have to keep in mind and which is usually rounded or oval. There may be a, a viable embryo or a non-viable embryo with a yolk sac and a closed internal loss. That is one of the most important factors that you need to understand. But then see, when it comes to the practical application, to identify whether the internal loss is closed or not is not that easy, as said in the literature or in the theory. Normal-sized uterus, but most important thing is there will be a ballooning of the cervix, which is one of the most important thing. And whenever you find a ballooning of the cervix with the gestation sac, you put the color doppler on. If you find that there will be a trophoblastic flow in the uh, elevated rear disc, which is seen as the, because of the trophoblastic tissue, then you are much more sure. Now the problem comes here is to differentiate that from uh, 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 um, abortion in progress. Right. Um, Lardmans, can you please tell us the pathophysiology of uh, cesarean scar pregnancy and what is exogenous and what is endogenous CSP? Dr. Lardmans, is there any problem? Hello? Unmute. Yeah. Dr. Lardmans, oh, yeah. please unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now, as far as the pathogenesis of uh, CSP is concerned, we must know what a normal pregnancy in what what happens in normal pregnancy? So in normal pregnancy, the chorionic frondosum is prevented from invading into the myometrium due to the decidua basalis, which forms a layer around the gestational sac. And for the CSP to occur, that is the cesarean scar pregnancy, there is a damage to the decidua basalis, either due to previous LSCS or due to manual re removal of placenta in the previous pregnancies, or there is some breach or any damage to the endometrial myometrial junction. So when there is damage to the decidua basalis, this causes a formation of small little tracts, which could be small or which could be macro tracts, which are not seen by ultrasound. And that's the reason why the blastocyst implants into the cesarean section scar. And second is when there is impaired decidualization. So this is the basis of a pathophysiology of formation of cesarean scars pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then, uh, sorry. So what is the progression of the implantation? So now it, it depends how a CSP would behave. Now, once it is implanted in the cesarean scar site, in the previous cesarean scar site, it depends how it grows. If it tends to grow, towards the uterine cavity, which is also called as endogenous or type one type of cesarean scar pregnancy, then the chances of placenta previa and accreta spectrum is there, right? However, 
if the CSP tends to grow towards the uterine cirrhosa, which is also called as exogenous or exophytic type of CSP, which is type 2, it has a deeper implantation of the gestational sac into the scar niche. This is called as into the niche, whereas the endogenous is called as on the scar site. So this can lead to potential chances of hemorrhage and a lot of uh, risk to the mother. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you just tell us something about the, the isthmoseals? Okay. Now, uh, it's, it's, uh, the isthmoseals are basically seen as fluid collections in the region of uh, cesarean scar, the previous cesarean scar. They may, be, uh, they may generally present with the post-menstrual bleeding irregular off and on. And they may have show anechoic areas or may also show us the blood which can be collected into these isthmoseals. Mm -hmm. So this, these are uh, uh, these are basically seen in a non-pregnant uh, situation. And uh, secondly, uh, it's very very important to treat the isthmoseals if you have to do an embryo transfer in cases of IVF pregnancy because it can cause damage to the embryo which is being transferred into that there are there is a lot of literature where people have aspirated uh, the contents prior to embryo transfer and also have undergone a lapar uh, laparoscopically isthmosteal repairs yes. so and then they also are uh, you know they form a bed for uh, a recurrent uh, pregnancy csp again yeah very nice uh, so that is the importance of an isthmosteal now, and they're not have... vascular on doctor. They will not show any vascularity because naturally yes. they're not, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they are not having any chorionic tissue as opposed yeah. to the CSP. Yeah, quite often whenever there is a thick uh, uh, tissue within the, you know, as isthmo seal, seal is a cyst or a cavity. So whenever there is this cavity is filled with a clot or a fibrous tissue, then what happens is it mimics as if as there is some gestational sac that has been implanted. That is one. Second thing is, as there is a roughening of the area, the blastocyst gets implanted in that particular area. That is the reason why it is essential that to identify isthmoseals in the uh, I mean, uh, non-gravid state, uh, correct okay. them, and then uh, allow them to conceal. So I think this is the most important message that we need to convey as far as the CSP is concerned. Now, what are the diagnostic criteria? Uh, may, uh, Mani, Manish, uh, how? Manit. So Manit. Sorry, sorry, Manit. Uh, so, uh, transvaginal sonography is uh, the best modality in experienced hands to diagnose uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. And uh, one thing I would like to add is that uh, in patients with previous cesareans, uh, early uh, the scan should be done early in the first trimester uh, to look for cesarean scar pregnancy. The main diagnostic criteria are the uterus has to be empty with clearly visualized endometrium. The endocervical canal has to be empty and the gestational sac, it is implanted in the anterior, lower, uh, anterior uterine segment at the level of the isthmus. Either the sac or the trophoblastic tissue uh, should be anteriorly and the biometrium between the gestational sac and the bladder, it has to be thin less than 5 mm. And the other signs which have been described are there uh, should be peritrophoblastic flow, which indicates a pregnancy implanted in the region of scar. Yeah. What are the other ectopics which uh, need to be differentiated uh, when you uh, take this sort of a, uh, in, uh, ultrasound features of uh, CSP? There are main two differentials uh, for cesarean scar pregnancy. One is uh, the ones which are, uh, which are seen in the lower part of the uterus. The one is the cervical ectopic pregnancy in which the pregnancy is uh, below the level of the internal loss. The cervix is ballooned and we see a gestational sac with trophoblastic re reaction and peritrophoblastic flow in the region of the cervix. And the anterior myometrium in the region of isthmus is usually normal. Or the second differential can be an abortion in progress in which the internal cervical loss can be open, the anterior myometrial thickness will be normal, and the products of conception are seen in the cervical canal. Usually they are non-viable, and they may show a sliding sign and a lack of trophoblastic flow around them. Fantastic. 
So basically, whenever we have to differentiate uh, CSP from cesarean uh, cervical scar, um, cervical ectopic pregnancy, or the abortion in progress, the anterior lower uterine segment myometrium being normal is the feature by which we can differentiate uh, cervical pregnancy and the abortion in progress. Now, coming to differentiate between the cervical ectopic and the abortion, as uh, as uh, Dr. Manish said, very many uh, it's uh, very clearly said that it is the the sliding sign which is going to be helpful, and uh, the abortion in progress can easily be mobilized. Whereas a cervical ectopic pregnancy, which is implanted and there is infiltration of the trophoblastic tissue, there is no way that you can mobilize or uh, uh, slide this uh, ectopic pregnancy within the cervical canal. So that is that is the thing. Now. Uh, Lord Burns, what is your experience as far as the, the intramural pregnancies are concerned? How do you differentiate them from invasive trophoblastic disease? Now, intramural pregnancies are very rare, one percent of all the ectopics which we see. And uh, it's, 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 it's certainly a difficult and a very challenging diagnosis, especially when you have a very uh, irregular or a heterogeneous mass of course, the history is important. You have to have a pregnancy test, which is positive. I happened to see a doctor very recently, and she came with a positive pregnancy test. And there was a mass which was seen close to the cirrhosa, and that was a uterine or a uh, sorry, the in in, in the myometrial. So then, basically, again, these are all the breach which occurs within the endometrium, and it is a kind of a uterine ectopic pregnancy. So this is basically due to the, again the uh, there has to be some traumatic injury to the endometrium, and which leads to this particular type of pregnancy. And and it is it is the invasion of the trophoblastic tissue into the myometry. Generally, they are seen close to the cirrhosa, and of course there are uh, signs which are pro uh, shown on MR, but even we can visualize on ultrasound if we. Uh, on a good hand, we can see a linear track of echogenic tissue, which is extending right up to the mass in the uh, of the into the ectopic area, and this uh, echogenic line is seen extending from the endometrium, that is the endometrial myometrial junction, and which is very well brought out on an MR, but you can still see it on an ultrasound. Well, it is very very challenging when you have a trophoblastic uh, invasion of the in, in case of uh, invasive mole and that's a very close differential and of course uh, all the more reason it is a, a, dif a difficult diagnosis because you are also having a beta hcg which is elevated but certainly in this uh, scenario when you have an invasive mole there are exceptionally high beta hcg values there are there is a definitive history of a molar evacuation say a uh, three to six months prior to the presentation of an invasive mole. And secondly, you need to see the adnexa. Again, that can give you a clue. You may have large thecalutin cysts, which produce a classical spoke wheel appearance, which can be seen with an invasive mole. But invasive mole, as far as differentiating an invasive mole from an uh, ectopic is that these are uh, echogenic masses, because again, it's a trophoblastic tissue. It's a chorionic villi. It's a hydropic degeneration of the chor chorionic villi. And they, these are predominantly seen close to the endometrium. Close to the endometrium, they may have increased vascularity as the myometrial ectopic, but they may have some cystic areas within it. The 2D differentiation of a mass is extremely important before we do our color Doppler. So if you see the 2D differentiation, you may see it is an echogenic mass with multiple cystic areas. Those cystic areas may, may not show any, may not take up color Doppler. Those are the those are the molar vesicles which are seen within the invasive mold. So that's yeah. how, you, and they're seen close to the endometrial lining. Whereas generally the myometrial ectopics, what I have seen, I've seen uh, three of them in my life and I see them close to the periphery. And one of them was a heterogeneous mass and the other two were classical uh, ecogenic with a yolk sac within it. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mons. It was wonderful. And uh, now I think, uh, what are the strategies? Of, uh, what are the management strategies, Dr. Geeta Anjali Kao? Yeah. You so, have rightly uh, the topic, and how do you expect them to be managed? Yeah. We have come a long way from uh, diagnosing my, my ectopics initially as an acute medical emergency. Now, usually we diagnose them during prodrome. So that has changed the management completely. So the management depends on three things. 
what is our beta hcg value what is the uh, clinical condition hemodynamic stability and what are the ultrasound findings what is the patient's preference that is also to be taken and what is her desire for future fertility that is also equally important in managing so if um, we have expectant management we do expected management in very small percentage of cases when we are dealing with very low levels of beta hcg especially when the levels are below 200 because nowadays beta hcg is easily done everybody gets it done googles it and gets it done so suppose the beta hcg is very less between less than 200 then yes medical uh, it's just expected management just following it till it becomes negative works pretty well Though it has been tried while going through the literature, I saw that beta, uh, expected management has been tried till beta HCG up to 2000 also, but many a times it fails. It works the best when it is done below 200. Then comes the medical management. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, the, there is a sac and it just has a yolk sac, definitely sac with a yolk sac, but does not have fetal cardiac activity. Beta HCG anywhere between 1500 to less than uh, 5000. And patients also uh, is ready for a follow up that is a very important thing in this and of course there has to be no intrauterine there is no heterotropic in such cases when we give systemic methotrexate whenever uh, methotrexate is given it is given as a systemic treatment here and here uh, patient has to be very willing to come for a follow up and that is very important here till the beta hcg comes out to be negative and be ready for this that any stage the medical management may fail and may require the patient may require a surgical management this is again very important for the patient to understand really then nice. uh, yeah, yeah. so Please here wait. in systemic we have uh, we have three options we have a single dose we have a uh, multiple dose where there can be two doses or a multiple dose depending upon how the beta hcg level progress through day 1 day 4 and day 7, seven. usually uh, Another thing we have to, uh, pain will occur. There's some pain will occur between day one to day four. So that has to be managed uh, with, uh, maybe you can repeat an ultrasound and a minimal fluid can also occur. So then also you need some patience and there may be little rise between in beta SCG from day one to day four. That is also to be patiently managed. The fall is to be seen from day four to day seven. And if the fall is less than 15%, then it is uh, significant and the patient needs to be counseled that there may be any fall more than 15% is a good fall. And uh, then uh, the usually the falling levels do occur. Though uh, literature is full of evidences when uh, rupture may occur even with plateauing or falling levels. So it has to be followed till the beta HCG becomes nil. But uh, initial uh, anxiety of the patient, of the doctor and the patient uh, can be adhered to when once the, there are falling levels. Uh, too many repeat ultrasounds should not be done, uh, exam, vaginal examination and TVS should not be done because they may still rupture. So that is another thing that too many, unless the, if the, unless the patient condition demands it. Otherwise, too, repeat, too many repeat uh, transvaginal ultrasounds should not be done. And then we have the surgical management. If a patient has completed her family, she cannot come for follow-up and she's hemodynamically unstable. She has a large mass with cardiac activity. Of course, we have to go for surgical management. In surgical management, we have uh, nowadays laparoscopy is almost the uh, rule of thumb, except for a few cases if the patient has had a uh, lot of previous abdominal surgeries, abdominal adhesions, or too big, too massive a uh, hemoperitoneum, then of course, laparotomy has to be done. Otherwise, laparoscopy is the... Uh, preferred choice especially now and uh, in laparoscopy again we have two procedures we can do a salpingectomy or salping gostomy salpingotomy is not done nowadays because that salpingotomy was earlier than where we used to suture the uh, tube so that is not done we uh, just do salpingostomy if that is also done if the uh, contralateral, contralateral tube is not in a good healthy condition and a patient is the kind who still wants not to go for IVF and uh, you feel that contralateral tube is already damaged, the mass is small in size. It has to be small in size and consent has to be previously taken that if at, if at any stage bleeding occurs, yes, salpingectomy will be done and that will be the uh, preferred mode of doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is one of the most important aspects uh, because... First and foremost thing, diagnosing ectopic pregnancy is uh, important. And then managing the, uh, I mean, planning the management or triaging the management strategies is again an important aspect. And Dr. Gitanjali has taken us through extremely well. And uh, she has clearly classified that you have three types of patients. One, who are very stable, no pain, no anxiety. These are the patients who can be expectantly or conservatively managed. Or patients who have... Uh, pain 
but uh, hemodynamically stable, still a laparoscopy or a lapro laparoscopy is advisable. But then when you have an uh, unstable patients or hemodynamically unstable patients with severe pain, I think the first approach is not to think about anything else, but to subject them to a laparoscopy. So I think this is the most important uh, strategy that we need to understand and uh, manage these patients. I think uh, my panelists have taken you through all uh, through wonderful cases, very rare, and most all of the ectopics uh, which can occur as of now, which we know has been, uh, has been taken through and we all know that they are very, very rare. And uh, they have given a clear idea regarding the management and when to manage, how to manage these patients. So then with this, I think uh, um, I will hand over back to Naveen so that uh, he can take you through the uh, quiz as well as the answers. And uh, I really thank my uh, panelists who have been wonderful who has given us a clear idea. And I'm sure from uh, tomorrow onwards, I think most of the delegates are very, very certain about uh, managing these uh, patients who present to them with a clinical suspicion of an ectopic pregnancy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Naveen, and thank you, SFM Didiana. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful panel discussion and exhaustive uh, discussions that we have on each and every topic, uh, the different types of ectopic pregnancies. I think we uh, we'll just, uh, I would uh, advise the panelists to just wait because the next section is the audience interaction. I would invite Sir Kunana, sir, uh, to take us to the audience interaction, please. Of, uh, taking up the audience question, sir. Now, I, I think, will you not finish off the quiz? Uh, I think, I, yeah. Okay, as you like. Yeah, let, let's finish the quiz. I think it's a good idea. We can do okay, that. Okay, so I think then I'll, I'll take on to the quiz. Uh, I'll yes. pick up the quiz. For that, uh, I will uh, ask uh, uh, Vishal to please. Uh, oh, do you want me to share the screen? Uh, sir, we are going to have the poll again. We'll have the poll again, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, please go ahead. So, yeah. So I'll I'll request all the the uh, delegates to log in into the quiz again, and uh, we would start with the first question right away, which is the crossover sign, and what is that used to do? It is it to differentiate cervical ectopic from cesarean scar ectopic or predict the surgical outcome of women presenting with abnormally invasive placenta in cesarean scar ectopic. The third option, option C is indicates pregnancy in the cornu. The fourth option is diagnose interstitial pregnancy. Now that uh, we have that wonderful discussion, the panel discussion, I think we all would be very well educated and we would be apprised about what the answers are. The, I would uh, repeat the options again. The first option is differentiate cervical ectopic from cesarean scar ectopic. The second option is predicts the surgical outcome of women presenting with abnormal invasive placenta in cesarean scar preg pregnancy. in uh, which is would be endogenous and exogenous CSP. Uh, third would be indicates pregnancy in the cornu and the last would be diagnose interstitial pregnancy. So we have 10 seconds left. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Right. I think uh, so, right. So this is the result of the poll. Uh, interestingly, um, many have chosen the first option, differentiate cervical ectopic from cesarean scar ectopic. Uh, that's about 54%, about 30% opted for the second option. And uh, uh, right. So can we go to the next question, please? Can we have the next question, please? Okay, the next question is, what are the pregnancies near uterotubal junction? The first is option A, eccentric pregnancies, 
pregnancies in the tube and intramural ectopic pregnancy. The second would be cesarean scar pregnancy, cervical pregnancy, and intramural pregnancy. The third would be angular pregnancy, conval pregnancy, and interstitial pregnancy. So we'll wait for about 10 seconds more. I would request everyone to log in the answers. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. So can we have the poll results, please? So uh, overwhelming majority have opted for option C. Uh, can we have the next question, please? Right. The third question is, what are the classical common features of tubal ectopic? Option A is gestation sac, fetal node, yolk sac, cardiac acuity, and collection in the Douglas pouch. The second is option B, empty uterus with collection in the Douglas pouch. The third is option C, bleb sign and basal sign. The fourth option D is empty uterus, cystic lesion in the adnexa with the ring on fire appearance on color Doppler. So, yeah. 10 seconds more. The first option is gestation sac, fetal node, yolk sac, cardiac activity in the Douglas pouch. Second is empty uterus with the collection in the Douglas pouch. Third is the bleb and bagel sign. The fourth is the empty uterus with the ring of fire and cystic lesion in the adnexa. Right. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, thank you so much. Right, well, uh, Interestingly, the fourth option is uh, about 57% have opted for option D. Let's see if you're right. Uh, can we go to the next question, please? Which of the coronal pregnancies are ectopic? The first option is ectopic in the interstitial portion of tube, gestation sac in the communicating horn, and gestation sac in the non-communicating horn. Second option is option B, gestation sac in one horn of a bicornuate uterus. Option C is gestation sac in one half of the septate uterus. And option D is the sac eccentrically located in the uterine cavity. So, we'll wait for everyone to log in the answers. We'll give about 10 seconds more. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Yes, an overwhelming majority have chosen the first option. Uh, can we go to the next question, please? So the last question is how to differentiate cervical pregnancy from abortion in progress? Is it option A, cervical pregnancy is pregnancy in the cervical canal? Whereas abortion in progress is pregnancy partly located in the uterine cavity. Option B, cervical pregnancy is located beyond the internal loss and abortion pregnancy is located beyond the external loss. Or option C, sliding sign positive in cervical pregnancy and negative in abortion progress. And the fourth option, sliding sign negative in 
cervical pregnancy and positive in abortion progress. So, 10 seconds more. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Yeah. So, I think everyone has given their options. Yeah. And that's a majority is option D, which is sliding sign negative in cervical pregnancy and positive in abortion progress. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vishal. And uh, I think now we'll go to the answers. So. Yeah. Naveen, you want me to share? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think uh, I would uh, if I could just share my screen now. Yeah. And uh, sir, could I give the answers now? Yeah, yeah. Please go. Ahead. I'm not able to open my window. Can you uh, can you uh, remove this uh, polling uh, cross sign? So the first question was a crossover sign. The correct answer was option B, which means it predicts the surgical outcome of women presenting with abnormally invasive placenta in caesarean scar pregnancy. Uh, Vishal, can we have the difference in poll results from the pre and post panel discussion? We had 22% uh, uh, before poll. And after poll, it is 54%. Sir. Or option B. So, yeah, a good amount of people have uh, opted for the right answer after the panel discussion. So, what is actually the crossover sign? So, when we see this figure over here of this pregnancy, we have these four figures. The crossover sign is basically a sign in which we draw two lines. The first line is, and this is taken in the sagittal section of the uterus in the TVA scan, and a straight la longitudinal line is drawn connecting the internal os and the uterine fundus through the endometrium. So that is the first line. And the second line is drawn through the sac, the gestation sac, if you see in this ultrasound picture, it is drawn perpendicular to the endometrial line that has been traced and it's drawn superior inferiorly diameter through the sac. So we have these four figures over here and we basically the crossover sign is divides this pregnancies into two types, cesarean scar pregnancy. That is COS1, that is crossover sign one, in which the sac is implanted within the sac, cesarean scar, and at least two thirds of the superior inferior diameter of the sac is above the endometrial line towards the anterior uterine wall, right? So that is COS1. And what is COS2? COS2 is of two types, but what is it actually is when the the, uh, the uh, line, the superior inferior line of the sac is less than two thirds of the uh, implantation above the endometrial line, right? So it is below two thirds above the endometrial line. And this is subdivided into two parts. Suez, Suez two plus, two uh, plus or two minus. Suez two plus means when it is indenting and abutting, interacting, intersecting the endometrial line, is when it's COS2 plus, and when it's not in intersecting the endometrial line, the first line is COS2 minus. And we and when we look at the next slide over here. So we have this figure that uh, Dr. TLN also, also showed us about the four types uh, of the scar pregnancy. And then we have the COS1. And what is COS1? This crossover sign one is when it is more than two thirds above the endometrial line and it is growing towards the anterior uterine wall, towards the serosa. And what is the implication? The implication is that this could actually rupture if it is growing outside and cause hemoperitoneum 
and be a catastrophic kind of uh, event or it could actually grow inward and become a cos2 now what is cos2 cs2 is either cos plus 2 plus or 2 minus plus as we already described this intersecting the endometrial line over here right and it is not intersecting the endometrial line over here right so cs2 plus is associated with a high degree of subtypes of placenta accreta and previa whereas cs2 minus the line does not intersect as we already described it is associated with lesser degree of placenta accreta and previa so that is about crossover line so the next question was what are the pregnancies near the uterine tu utera tubal junction and what was the answer the answer is option c angular pregnancy coronal pregnancy interstitial pregnancy right so as we have already listened to all the panelists uh, as dr tilen sir has already told this angular pregnancy terminology should not be used we should rather use the term as a normal eccentric intrauterine pregnancy and we have already described interstitial pregnancy and we can see this is an interstitial pregnancy yes. with a thin myometrial mantle inter interstitial part of the tube and third part is a coronal pregnancy which could be in the communicating or non committing horn of this unicornate uterus which is a non communicating horn of a unicornate uterus the third question was what were the classical diagnostic features of tubal ectopic uh, before that uh, vishal could you tell us uh, how many percent of people have improved uh, on their performance in the second question please vishal yes sir in the second question sir uh, before the uh, panel we have 89% people voted for c option and after the panel it was 93% sir okay so that we have a definite improvement in the performance in the second question and if we go to the third question uh, the third question the answer was c right and how many people actually uh, improved in the performance in the third question uh, uh, option c is the bleb and the bagel sign the classical diagnostic features of tubal ectopic okay uh, in question number 3 before uh, the panel it was 13% only opted for option c and after the panel it has increased to 57% so so that's very nice that's very nice and uh, so option c is the right answer the bleb and the bagel sign and so and we and we have this uh, features of a tubal ectopic this is the live tubal ectopic sorry i can't the uh, video is not working but we can see this live embryo this is a very diagnostic sign but we can't get it so often and this is the bagel sign which is also seen in 20 percent of cases but with a high predictive value both of them are seen with a high value and this bleb sign is this inhumanous mass in the adnexa is seen in 60 percent of tubal ectopic pregnancies also with a high sensitivity and specificity and a positive predictive value of 95 percent so the bleb and the bagel, bagel sign right so what is the next question the next question is which of the coronal pregnancies are ectopic right the answer was a which is the jishin sac in the interstitial portion of the tube in the communicating horn communicating horn or non communicating horn so here we have this different images that we have already seen in the uh, panel discussion earlier so this is basically uh, interstitial pregnancy seen in the interstitial part of the tube and this is a community communicating horn of a unicornate unicornate uterus right and this is a non communicating horn so these are the three a b and c are the ectopic pregnancies and this is a biconvert uterus and the sac is seen in one horn of the biconvert uterus so this is called a convert uterus but it is a non ectopic it's a uterine pregnancy oh lovely and this is the c option is the sac in the one half of a septate uterus oh. also a normal intrauterine pregnancy and this is the third is the eccentrically located which is early called as angular pregnancy is eccentrically located intrauterine pregnancy and uh, how many percent of people opted for the right answer in the first uh, improved the performance vishal uh, sir in question number 4 be before the panel it was 79% and after the poll it is 88% sir 
yeah that's good so and uh, we go to the last question how to differentiate cervical pregnancy from abortion progress and the answer was option d which is sliding sign negative in uh, uh, basically uh, cervical pregnancy and positive in abortion in progress right so how many people actually improved the performance uh, vishal uh, it was sir uh, 63% before the panel and after the panel it goes to 75% so very good yeah so uh, so here we have basically the cervical uh, pregnancies or, or picture over here with this ultrasound image and we can see that this is the sliding sign if we could put a t was sorry the video is not working but we have seen the sliding sign in the talk by dr um, rajiv uh, also he used it in cervical pregnancy so this this uh, sac basically will remain stationary not move whereas in cervical pregnancy uh, whereas abortion progress this will move right so that's that's the end of our uh, and how many people actually improved their performance in this uh, vishal the fifth question hello yes sir in question number 5 i told uh, this is uh, uh, 63% before the panel okay okay we have already have the answer yes, yes. So thank you so much thank you so much and uh, i think over to uh, kurana sir sir for the audience interaction well here we go uh, a, a very good evening to all of you sorry i'm not in the most perfect of connectivity today um, the uh, questions have been very interesting but very few but before we go on to them i want to congratulate uh, dr navin perera and his entire team uh, from ludhiana for two things one is for being able to convince us that ectopic pregnancy is worth considering at a fetal medicine forum and the argument we had was it's pure ultrasound it's pure clinics it's a combination where does fetal medicine come in the question is that a large number of pregnancies um, uh, can be encountered in this situation where the same person who's practicing fetal medicine would like to also attend to these because it's part of everyday practice but most importantly what came out was that the method that we use in our way of teaching at webinars seems to be so useful that people would like to have a uh, subjects that are part of obstetrics but not strictly part of fetal medicine uh, to be included and uh, we are now convinced that this is the way to go that we should possibly every now and then not very frequently have uh, topics uh, that are related to obstetrics but not related directly to fetal medicine because we seem to have hit upon a really good way of uh, getting the message across to our attendees thank you very much to a fabulous panel and of course a very special thanks to dr tian and praveen for Uh, guiding us uh, through this whole thing and and teaching each one of us. Uh, the second interesting thing is that with this particular webinar, we have introduced polls, which we never used to have before. We thought they would be expensive and cumbersome, uh, but uh, thanks to conferences international, we now have them at uh, no additional cost. And I think it would make uh, the uh, audience a little more engaged, a little more interactive. And we had a fair degree of participation. Over fifty percent of the attendees. I uh, did participate uh, there is no doubt that it, that we have also been able to improve our messages uh, as is obvious from the poll and this would be a great way to make sure that we continue to do things correctly there are not too many questions in the question box uh, but i think we'll go through those uh, starting from the ones uh, that were right in the beginning some of these are going to be a repeat of what was uh, said uh, during the panel discussion but i think it's nice to actually um, Uh, re repeat that so that we can remember some of the figures. And uh, the question was: uh, Do high-end machines uh, actually um, show us uh, levels uh, at a lower HCG threshold? And this was a suggestion and a question by Dr. Chellapan uh, K. So, anybody on the panel who would like to remark on this? Let's start with Dr. T. N. Praveen and say, "Okay, yeah, can uh, you please get back with the question?" I, uh, I Uh, high-end machines can show us the gestational sac at a level much lower than um, uh, the beta HCG. So yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely, the the resolution of the machine is definitely important. Yeah. More than the resolution, it is the expertise. 
I think it has been through, I mean, stated very clearly that when you try to evaluate a PVL, pregnancy of unknown location, uh, your expertise is judged by your ability to diagnose a gestation or identify a gestation sac. And you should, your PUL levels should always be less than 15%. If your levels of PUL uh, are less than 15%, you are good. Your expertise, your expertise is accepted. And uh, uh, so it is the expertise plus the resolution of the mission which is going to help us. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, there was a request for Dr. Larpals to explain the decidualized endometrium in a perimenopausal woman which is frequently reported in histopathology. You did answer it in the question box, but if you could please repeat the answer for us. In a decidualized endometrium, we basically, it's a pregnancy endometrium. That's why decidualization occurs, right? So whenever we have a thickened endometrium, you do see cystic spaces. You don't see it so commonly. So whenever you see cystic spaces, which are seen along the periphery of the thickened endometrium, and they do not show any ecogenic rim, as you see it with intrauterine pregnancies. So that is how you differentiate a decidualized endometrium from the thickened endometrium or endometrial hyperplasia. Thank you. And the next question is for Dr. Chinmay. And this was on why we can't use uh, intrasac potassium chloride and uh, systemic methotrexate uh, concomitantly, or can we? Um. Well, we can use it. The point is, uh, when we are trying to use intra um, potassium chloride in a pregnancy which is still connected to the maternal circulation, we are a little concerned. And like Sir uh, Praveen Sir already said, that potassium chloride can only help us achieve asystole. Whereas if we use our methotrexate properly, we can not only achieve the asystole by an indirect method, but also uh, stop the trophoblastic invasion further into the tissues. Because like it was explained, especially in cases of cesarean scar pregnancies, which are now becoming a real uh, menace for most of us, the uh, prevention of the trophoblastic invasion is far more important than, you know, uh, worrying about the viability of that pregnancy because it can cause it can be a life-threatening situation in fact these are some of the cases where even if we have to intervene by a, a endoscopic method like a hysteroscopy or a laparoscopy doing a needle guided methotrexate installation prior to planning such a procedure might actually help us reduce the morbidity of those procedures because otherwise you have a lot of blood loss and a lot of morbidity to handle at that point so theoretically, we could do both, but if we have to choose one, we'll probably choose methotrexate. Excellent, thank you so much for that. And then a very interesting question from Dr. Archana Goyal. Uh, if the beta HCG level is below 300, and we do happen to see a small ectopic mass on an ultrasound scan in a patient uh, who is largely asymptomatic and consecutive beta HCG levels show a falling trend, what would be the management option? Wait and watch up to beta HCG level below five or uh, should we be more aggressive? Do you want me to answer? Yeah, yes, please, Dr. Tien. Yeah, See, the, the, the most important thing is that uh, once you say that there is a falling beta HCG, we need to know how much is the fall. That is one most important thing. If the fall is uh, more than 13%, uh, and the ratio is uh, less than 0 0.087. Positively, we don't need to hurry up anything. We can just wait and watch. Uh, another important thing is that uh, whenever we try to stop following, it is essential that you need to demonstrate the beta HCG levels below the non-pregnant levels. That is at least less than 25 uh, international units per ml. So these are the criteria that we need to follow. And whenever you have a gestation sac that has been demonstrated by uh, uh, ultrasound and there is a fall in beta HCG levels, we usually consider it as a failing ectopic pregnancy. Thank you. Our next question moves on to um, a question from Dr. Shilpa T. And she wants to know the criteria for diagnosing a ruptured ectopic. Any one of our clinicians, please? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. The patient uh, is usually comes with a lot of pain, severe pain, can have fainting attacks at home. That is, uh, and then when you see the, she may come in shock, clinically shock, or she may, uh, on putting a probe, you will see a massive hemoperitoneum. 
the uh, hemoperitoneum, the fluid will have a lot of echogenic echogenicity, and in that um, uh, you may be able to see a mass also. Sometimes, if you try to see, you may be able to see a mass. And otherwise, if a patient has having rising beta HCG levels, then you will have to be doing ultrasound and seeing that without just in the process of rupture also. So severe pain, uh, fainting attacks, and uh, hemodynamic and instability, having low BP and paler, looking too pale, a patient looking too pale. Those are the things that a patient may Any come. patient with a positive pregnancy test presenting to an emergency with pain and uh, you know, kinds of shock in, yeah. in obstetric emergency has to be Take treated nice. as an ectopic unless proved otherwise. Otherwise, exactly, ma'am. Yeah, we have. To, uh, but nowadays, usually patients come with a diagnosis. They have a beta HCG test with them. True. They have yeah. some ultrasound pictures with them. So usually they come, we diagnose them in the prodrome when they come with all this. So, yes. And then we, many of them are on medical management and then they do rupture. Then also we diagnose them and sometimes they refuse treatment. They say, no, you, we still want to persist with medical management. And then also they rupture. So we see all, all sorts of patients. Yeah, patients stuck tachycardia and the obstetrician's tachycardia is also yeah. another diagnosis. Yeah. <laughs> and then there is something else that gives us all tachycardia, which is uh, trying to figure out which ectopics are leaking. Which ectopics are? Leaking. Uh, you know, as opposed to a ruptured ectopic, a topic that is leaking, um, a peritoneal leak, for instance. Dr. Vani, if you could give us an input onto that. I think Dr. Deka, she presented the first case, which was similar with a live ectopic and a hemoperitoneum yes. and which we do see where the bleeding happens from the tubal end and the baby is still in there and there is a little bleeding before it actually dies out and uh, but again the patient will present with pain excruciating pain and we should not sit on it just because it's live that's the message here I, yeah. this happened with me just a few days back Naveen is smiling it was a nine weeks live ectopic and uh, there was very little fluid and we were thinking should we do it right now or should we wait till the morning but uh, i wasn't feeling good i took him real time on a video conference call and uh, then we decided that let's take it and thank god because that is exactly what sir was talking about she was bleeding but the baby fetus was intact so just a little sharing and you sent the pictures of the fetus afterwards right Yes, it was a nine weeks fetus. Yeah. And um, uh, there's another very interesting question on the medical legal implications of missing an early ectopic. Or, or for that matter, missing a late ectopic. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to volunteer to, to bell the cat for this one? Um, I think, yeah. yes, I think sir, we'll right. get <laughs> We yes. can always be taken to task for that. That is always at our back of our mind. Yes, we always have to be scared of it. It may be the future for us obstetricians. I think yeah. Praveen sir was saying something. Yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, no, sir, we'd yeah. like to listen from the experience that you've had. What do you think? I mean, should we be scared at every point? Suppose you no, don't see an no. intrauterine pregnancy. And especially nowadays with all this PCOS and everything, you know, you see so many things here and there. So... Are we going to be scared of an ectopic every time we don't see an intrauterine? Actually, I think it's a challenge thrown to us. I think we have to face it. And uh, probably the more you see, the more you are careful, the more you try to methodically approach this problem, I think the better the results are. And I, I think just uh, shunning off and uh, moving away is not going to solve the problem. It's going to get back. Whether it is you or me or someone else, we have to face that one and we have to find a solution. So it is better to face and I think, see, we can, can't always be afraid of a medical legal. See, as yeah. long as your intent is good and if you are doing it properly, methodically, scientifically, I think there is no reason why we should be afraid of. And it has to be a complete uh, assessment. You have to take the clinical yes. history into account. You have to I take mean, the beta-HCG level into account. And like Sir said, stepwise document your ultrasound. So if it's a positive finding, then excellent. If it's a negative finding is when we are worried. So it's good to tell the patient that we didn't see anything, but that doesn't mean that there is, it isn't there. So, yes. you know, be on follow-up. If you have a symptom, come back. Even if the obstetrician wants to admit for observation for 24 hours, that's also done because you'll get your beta HCG level after that. So I think, <coughs> we can, I mean, instead of just being scared, just do proactively do the right things. Yes. Excellent. 
And uh, moving on to our next question, we have two uh, questions relating to the same one, one from Upasana Barua and one from Prina Agarwal. And they want to know how to differentiate clinically and on ultrasound um, chronic ectopics uh, from a non-ectopic tubo ovarian mass. Oh, differentiate between an ectopic and a non-ectopic tubo ovarian mass. A chronic ectopic, chronic ectopic. Uh -huh. uh, and a tubo ovarian uh, mass, either clinically or uh, on ultrasound. See, basically on ultrasound, you do see them both as adnexal masses. Uh, both of them will have uh, probably increased vascularity. Probably one of the most important thing is the clinical history, uh, particularly with intermittent spotting, uh, period of amenorrhea, pain, as well as uh, the beta HCG. Whereas in an adnexal mass, which is usually, suppose if you take it as a tubo ovarian mass or an abscess, uh, probably the patient's clinical presentation will be entirely different. So you need to take it as a holistic approach, but not as a fragmented one, just by an ultrasound to differentiate between an adnexal mass, uh, which could be an ectopic or which could be a tube mass. So I think you need to put all these things together. I think that's what my opinion is. If there is anything else, please. So I would like to add some one point here. Yes. Yeah. In a chronic ectopic pregnancy, the patient usually presents with an acute episode of uh, pain when it is ruptured and forms a mass which is missed. In a tubo ovarian mass, there will be some sort of pain which has been prolonged, but not an acute episode like in chronic ectopic. So that is one differentiating point in the history. And then examination wise, I think both will be almost similar because of the tenderness uh, will be there in chronic ectopic as well as in a tubo ovarian mass because tubo ovarian mass is basically because of pelvic inflammatory disease. Mm -hmm. So clinically, uh, it would help, but ultrasound definitely, that also... I, I have a very interesting uh, experience recently came across. Um, I did ablate an ectopic pregnancy, particularly the tubal ectopic pregnancy. Um, the beta HCGs have come down, but then the patient came back with severe pain. So on ultrasound, I found that it was almost an avascular area there, avascular mass. So then they, when they went back to her uh, gynecologist who did a laparoscopy, who, she found that this ablated mass was tossed. And that was the one which was uh, giving pain. So they did, a, his, uh, they, uh, they did the resection and sent it for her histopathology. Trophoplastic tissue was ablated, but the pedicle was uh, twisted. So the twisted ablated mass was the one which caused severe pain. So these are some I mean, rare uh, problems that we do definitely come across. Yes, and you know, to think that something where anatomy has got fixed post endometriosis, post tuberculosis, post, post infection, and yet in that fixed frozen anatomy, torsion takes place, teaches us in medicine that the strangest can happen. <laughs> I remember the first time I discovered an intrauterine pregnancy, I said, as a matter of policy, let me look into the adnexa, and I discovered a right adnexal ectopic. When I saw the right and next leg topic, I discovered a second right and next leg topic. And to my absolute horror, a third right and next leg topic. And then I discovered a fourth left and next leg topic. So we felt very, very happy that, okay, the 15,000 HCG has been explained. An absolute horror of horrors, three months down the line, we discovered an ab abdominal ectopic pregnancy. So, I mean, these are rare things that happen to us off and on, but the fact remains, that the heterotopic pregnancy is something that you and me can never be swearing anything about. We really have to be careful to say that, yes, we did do a curatage, that we did get rid, that we did find villi, and yet we can always, sometime down the line, discover that there is an adnexalic topic because it grows at a completely different pace. So even six months down the line, you might discover that there is this mass, which is chronic ectopic. And so we have to keep a very, very open mind and like, We've been saying for the last hundreds of years, think ectopic. Uh, would everybody agree on this, that whenever you find a mass, whenever you find abnormal uterine bleeding, whenever you find a pregnancy, think ectopic. Would the clinicians agree with me on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't, don't ever, ever agree, uh, yeah. agree on that, that we must, in every event of any gynecological symptom, think of two things, A, ectopic, B, tuberculosis. I think in our background, we can never forget these. And we do see many more ectopics than anywhere else. 
in the world apart from the American blacks. Uh, there is a very interesting question from Dr. Ira Anupama Soreng, and she says, how can a patient develop uterine pregnancy after giving methotrexate for a non-viable tubal pregnancy after one week? I mean, how come with that load of methotrexate that an intrauterine pregnancy would actually happen to continue growing? Uh, no, I, I didn't understand the question. So it means that we discovered a tubal ectopy. Okay. Yes, and we discovered some sort of a fluid collection in the uterus. And we gave methotrexate. Yes, and it wasn't a, uh, a tubal pregnancy containing an embryo. Uh, it was just an ordinary tubal, non an embryonic pregnancy. And then we've given her the methotrexate. And then a week later, I see a growing sac inside the uterus. Yeah. Yes, it is possible. Possible it is and possible. it's dangerous. In fact, we had recently one patient where there was an intrauterine pregnancy. There wasn't even a non-uterine, uh, um, I mean, no ectopic pregnancy because they suspected pregnancy of unknown location for, I don't know, some kind of workup where they thought the dates uh, passed. They gave the methotrexate and she came back with a viable pregnancy which she wanted to continue and I was really worried about it because <laughs> she was a doctor herself and she was very desperate about continuing. I think fortunately she had a spontaneous uh, like uh, miscarriage in by eight weeks, which I thought was good for her, but uh, it happens. Yes, and why it happens we don't know, but the methotrex doesn't seem to hit some pregnancies and it does seem to hit the same pregnancy uh, in the same patient. And sometimes it hits one in the same patient. Doesn't but it's it? the same, sir, even for ectopic. When we give a systemic methotrexate, we sometimes have to repeat it in some of them. So the trophoblastic tissue has different potential in different. Yes, yes. absolutely. And there are certain situations when you do an intrasac, still you would like to give a systemic methotrexate. Systemic. Absolutely. Um, and we have a lot of congratulations for all of this. And the perpetual question, and this is from Dr. Sushma Reddy, can we please have this discussion on YouTube, sir? Of course, you can have all our discussions on YouTube. And you just have to be a little patient because we have some editing issues and we have some copyright issues and we will put them on as soon as we can. Uh, then there is this um, interesting question on what is the reason, and Dr. Geeta Devi wants to know, what is the reason for false negative ur uh, urine pregnancy test in an ectopic apart from a technical error in the card. So why does an ectopic have, that means I see an ectopic and I get a-, um, a Negative unit, pregnancy test. Which is, yes. And I'm using a sensitive one, which would detect 50 units anyway. Yeah, but there's so many reasons. Detect, one she has given is the false, uh, I mean, the card is defective. And yeah. sometimes even with very high beta HCG levels, they say you can have a negative uh, result because uh, it, it tends to, the analytes tend to compete with each other. So I, I think it's called the hook effect or something like that, where yeah. very high levels can, and if the urine is very diluted, that could be one of the reasons. So, In the topic they say, because of the enhanced clearance of beta SCG also, that could be one of the reasons for a negative urine pregnancy test. And obviously, the low levels of beta SCG in ectopic pregnancy as compared to normal pregnancy because the villi will not be adequate enough to give a positive pregnancy test. Yeah. There are these reasons for a negative urine pregnancy test for ectopic. And uh, we are not going to allow any more questions to pour in because I think we're really going beyond time today. Um, yeah. but, but this question from Dr. Mandeep Kaur, she saw a patient with a chronic unruptured ectopic mass seven centimeters, <coughs> otherwise asymptomatic apart from an odd pain. So no gestational sac, no fetal pole, no hemoperitoneum, seven centimeter mass, how to manage? What's the beta HCGs? Sorry? What's the beta HCGs? I should have mentioned the beta HCG, but presuming that the beta HCG was 74 units. <laughs> you treat it as an ectopic. <laughs> <laughs> And what if it was 3,074 units? Positively treated as an ectopic. Yes. If you don't see an entire train sac. And would I in intervene surgically or would I then use uh, methotrexate? Uh, well, it is a little tricky in the sense we need to really know about the beta HCGs and beta HCG titrus ratios. Without that, I think it is 
and, and the whole clinical picture so if she's pictures, stable yeah. uh, really no bad. other issues and maybe just repeat it after some time see yeah. if it's not increasing any other reason for having hcg because we are assuming that that is the mass and everything is related to the ectopic yes. yeah but if if and it's some other hcg secreting tumor absolutely and we do find some of the embryonal cell tumors the germ cell tumors and and some others which will secrete oh. hcg um, uh, um, a wonderful reminder from dr jashri said that uh, it is mandatory to demonstrate a gestational sac before prescribing uh, pills for a uh, oral medical termination of pregnancy Absolutely. and um, then an, an interesting question from dr bina mishra um, a patient who two months ago had taken the mtp pill ultrasound shows clots in the endometrial cavity no ectopic seen beta hcg 5200 how do i manage this case uh, how should you argue that it, they are clots? Could be a trophoblastic tissue, the remnants of the trophoblastic tissue, because beta HCG is still high. It's molar for that matter. Huh? Yeah, molar. Molar also. for that yes. matter. Yes, yes, yes. So endometrial sampling can be done. And endometrial sampling can be done in this case and see if it is chorionic villi, then it confirms that it is not PUL. Absolutely. So, so a combination of just doing an office procedure um, can can really sort this out and you don't require any elaborate histopathology for this particular thing. The moment you pull out the aspirate, you put it into any biological solution, flush it, and you can see the villi actually floating there. It doesn't take any great guns and you don't even need a pathologist if you're used to seeing um, uh, aborted material. Um, there's a very interesting case from Dr. Neelam Sodi, and this will be our last question for tonight. A patient presented with incrementally rising beta HCG, but at seven weeks of, uh, but at seven weeks from her last menstrual period, more than eight thousand in international units beta beta HCG. There was no gestation sac, intra, extra uterine or CBN scans, only a seven millimeter query intra decidual sign, which showed no increase with increasing beta HCG levels. And how do I manage such a patient? No, basically, uh, I mean, the, the way it has been presented, it, it, it looks definitely that uh, you need to explain the race in the beta HCG. Uh, so once you have a race in the beta HCG, that obviously means that there is some trophoblastic tissue. I mean, at least if, if you think, consider it. There are various other causes which could be responsible for the race in the beta HCG. But pertinent to this today's talk, in some case, if it is because of the ectopic, then we need to think very positively that there should be uh, some trophoblastic tissue somewhere which has to be searched. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. We are now. Uh, it does not rise. I think after some time it should start falling. Yeah. <laughs> it's clinically stable. <laughs> Just follow it. And if it's falling, then that's a sign of uh, failing. Yeah. Some kind of failure. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you can do a bit of cheating and do a really vigorous, rough vaginal examination and see. No, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, sir. What I really want to emphasize that in a patient with pain, we really have no entitlement to push things around beyond the point. We do know that these patients can rupture under our fingers. And we really ought to be very, very careful if we're looking at things from a clinical point of view. And she is having that pain and she is having the equivalent of even the earliest sliding sky uh, sign without, you know, we, we started using ultrasound transducers much later. We really have to be gentle and make sure that we don't complete a process of tubal abortion, which is going on, or we don't dislodge a fibrin clot and induce a pouring hemorrhage into a peritoneum. So we really, really ought to be very, very gentle when we do examinations and we think ectopics then anyway, every examination should be gentle and not push beyond the point. Any last inputs from the panels? I hand over this whole thing back uh, to our organizers for tonight with personal congratulations from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good night. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you, sir. So, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. At the very thank end, you. I'd like to thank everyone.
and uh, for participating in the webinar it has been a long but i i don't think it has been a very interesting one and i think i could not take my eyes off the screen and i think most of the delegates would agree uh, i would definitely want to thank at the outset dr tilian sir for giving us an excellent insight and approach to this very pertinent topic and putting the time and agreeing to help whenever i wanted to call him he was always there to discuss he shared his exhaustive knowledge his mastery on this field sending this wonderful images and helping out in preparing the quiz and sharing his, his knowledge and congrats to the presenters too for their wonderful effort and um, i would also say the panelists for their views on this uh, and educating us on this new strategies i think we have all learned and had been educated to how to diagnose and manage ectopic pregnancy uh, dr ladban in a special note for helping out in the quiz uh vishal at the sfm secretariat for helping out in everything and sumit ghai for helping out in the logistics especially the quiz part because we were just learning over there not to forget the delegates who put in the time to log in and attend finally kurana sir for guiding and motivators always and helping out putting things in place all the academics and uh, in short for summing everything in his own inimitable style in the audience interaction for always being there thank you sir and thank you everyone thanks a lot yeah. thank, thank you thank you very much thank you everyone bye bye good night good night thank you everyone thank you